Recording is started. Deputy Mayor. Thank you, Teresa. Are we ready to go? We are ready to go. Thank you so much. Good evening, everyone. Sorry for the short delay. This is our City Council study session for July 12th, 2021. And this meeting is called to order for Governor Inslee's Emergency Proclamation 20-05 and 20-28. And stay safe, stay healthy. The city of Auburn is holding public meetings virtually at this time. City of Auburn resolution number 5581 designates the city of Auburn meeting locations for our regular, special, and study session meetings of the city council and of all the committees, boards, and commissions of the city as virtual locations until Washington's governor authorizes local governments to conduct in-person meetings. Teresa, we please call the roll. Deputy Mayor DeCourcy. Here. Council Member Baggett. Here. Council Member Brown. Here. Council Member J. Raj. I'm here. Council Member Malinga. Here. Council Member Stearns. Here. Council Member Trout Manuel. Council Member Trout Manuel. She was on, she may have gotten disconnected. Okay, I assume she will be back on. Council Member Trout Manuel. Here, sorry, I got kicked off. <laughs> okay, thank you. All right, we will move into our agenda items for council discussion this evening. And the first item on the agenda is a presentation on body camera technology and services. And I'll turn it over to Chief O'Neill at this time. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. Uh, good evening, members of council. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and briefly turn this over to Commander Steve Stalker, um, who will then assist us with an outside presentation. Thank you, Chief. Good evening, council members. Uh, thanks for having us tonight. Um, just really super briefly before I introduce uh, Alan Sleiper, he's going to be our presenter, I believe, um, from Axon. Um, I just really briefly just wanted a quick introduction just to let you know that we've been a uh, partner with Axon since the year 2000. Um, that is when uh, we started carrying the taser gun, which is what Axon uh, manufactures. Um, so we've been partners with them for a long time and now they've, they're at a point now where they have, um, the, the taser gun, we're looking at transitioning to an entire new system called the officer safety plan, which includes up, upgrading to the brand new taser gun in car video system, body camera for the officers, uh, an interview room system and an add on to our drone program as well as evidence.com, which is an evidence-based digital software program, which is in the cloud, which will store all of the data from all of those mediums that I just discussed. Um, so at this point, I would like to turn it over to the Axon representatives, if I may, uh, for them to uh, do their presentation. Hopefully they'll be able to do that. I, I see that there he's in there as an attendee, so I'm not sure how that works. All right, you guys able to hear me? Oh, and James Hillary is with us also. Hi, James. Hey, how are you, Commander? Good. Alan, we can hear you. Okay, good, good. Uh, well, thanks for having us here, guys. It's, it's not a lot, not often we get a lot, uh, chance to, to speak with uh, city government directly. So uh, again, thanks for having us. We're here to help the, the PD and uh, help you guys understand uh, our vision as a, as a public safety technology company. Um, well, here, I'll throw my, my screen on. I wasn't sure if you guys were going to run the screen or not, but I was prepared either way. One second. Okay. 
And James Knight, your slides, I'll just, uh, I'll speak to them. Okay, that sounds good. So you'll speak to them, I'll control them. Yeah, okay. The full screen. All right, does everybody see the uh, Exxon logo that's here in my shirt? And three slides. Yep. All right, thanks guys. Uh, so, you know, obviously, like, like Commander Slocker said, we've, we've been working with uh, the PD for quite some time on the taser side of things. Um, I, myself, Alan Slipper, I'm, I'm a regional manager here at Axon. I've been here about three years. I work on the body camera and software side. James Hillary is your uh, CEW or taser representative, and he'll speak through some of the taser and virtual, virtual reality training uh, technology that we're, um, that's under consideration by the PD. So that'll begin. Uh, you've noticed the taser since 93. Uh, change your name to Axon because we're trying to reflect that we're more than just a weapons manufacturer and uh, truly creating from the ground up organically a public safety technology platform from front to back. It's an important distinction to make because a lot of our competitors will piece together technology and, and tell you that it's going to work all together as they do acquisitions. That's not our business model. Overarching mission at Axon is to protect life. This drives all product innovation, features, and functionality that we deliver to our partners. And we feel the best way to do this is through a network of devices, apps, and people. It's a really simple breakdown. Devices are things like body-worn cameras, in-car video, drones, CCTV, mobile phones, just tons of devices that help you capture content. Uh, but the important thing is that that content is only as good as the data behind it to allow you to search and manage that content. So we work with a number of different software apps to uh, help you categorize and manage video for search and retention later, and also help you with redaction as, as, as body-worn programs grow, uh, more and more FOIA requests and things of that nature will come across. And then finally, once you have that nice redacted video, it's only really useful if you can put it in the hands of those who make decisions in your investigative and resolution process. So uh, command staff, uh, uh, supervisor, professional standards, uh, but you likely have to share it with your DA, who not only needs a way to receive it, but also a place to store it when they get it. This nation, that, this, this, nation, this, this uh, network is the foundation of everything we do and aligns with our mission to protect life. So to date, we have about 17,000 agencies on the platform, ranging from small two sworn sheriff's offices to some of the largest in the world. Um, locally, in the state of Washington, this is our, our current customer list. Uh, it, it is growing, obviously, with the new legislation that was, that was pushed out this year. Um, we are talking to more and more agencies and plan to have more customers. Uh, but this gives you a good, uh, quick overview of who's using Axon on the body-worn side uh, in Washington state. You know, we, we're trying to, to accomplish a few different things, and we have three key principles when we aim to protect life. The first is decrease use of force. This goes back to our first taser weapon that was ever created, uh, and we're continuing that legacy today with Taser 7, which is a part of the bundle that the PD is considering. Now, additionally, our technology is designed to decrease the cost of litigation that agencies are now more exposed to than ever. If you think about the hard costs associated with the absence of a strong digital evidence management program, things like workers' comp, uh, settlement costs, litigation dollars, you know, the sensors that we're building are, are really designed to drive true cost savings. And finally, we understand that when agencies add uh, new systems, it actually adds work to uh, the day-to-day and -day the, the process. And that's not what we're trying to do. We, we believe that an agency should be able to streamline workflows um, and, and do less administration work once they deploy our solutions. So to give you an idea of how all the technologies that the PD is considering, um, I'm going to walk you through a call for service that your officers probably see on a, on a pretty regular basis. So we have a disturbance here. This gentleman probably had a little bit too much to drink, besides now is a good time to strike up an argument with a neighbor. Uh, things start to escalate. Other neighbors gather outside. And because it's report of a weapon, police are called and they report, uh, and they approach with lights and sirens. Upon arrival, they see our subject engaged in a heated exchange with his neighbor. Uh, other, other neighbors gathered around recording with their cell phones. Officers approach our subject, try to verbally de-escalate the situation to no avail. So fortunately, one of the officers uh, has his taser on him, uh, unholsters that, deploys a warning arc. That's just a, a sight and sound, not actually deploying it. And fortunately, a sight and sound of that arc is enough to get this guy to comply. He's safely taken into custody. So now that we have de-escalated that situation, let's look at what's happening when the officers arrived on scene. Uh, when the officer switched on his light bar, it activated both his in-car camera and his uh, body work camera. The benefit there, didn't have to think about activation and could focus on how he was going to de-escalate the situation. Now, if things had escalated further, 
uh, the, uh, the watch commander back at the station had GPS location of each of his officers, and if things had escalated further, uh, they could tap into a live stream with one of the recording cameras to provide additional context and guidance to other approaching officers. Now, as we transition to interviewing the witnesses, one of the, one of the officers learned the subject actually tried to strike his neighbor, and another neighbor caught it on his cell phone. Using Axon Citizen, which is part of our capture mobile app, uh, we can supply that neighbor with a secure link via text or email, with which that neighbor can then upload the video directly uh, to uh, his evidence.com account. So there's no uh, confiscating phones or taking a video of the video. That same app can then be used to take pictures, videos, and audio statements also. Um, that all go directly to the officer's evidence.com account. So no uh, need to go back and you know, physically upload it. It happens automatically. Back in the station, our subject interview is recorded. The PD is looking at our Axon interview system. Um, so they approach this, this subject with uh, the video of him trying to strike his neighbor. Um, he confesses, it's formally charged. Now, when those officers complete their shift, they dock their body cameras, they dock their taser batteries to get a full charge, upload the video and the taser logs, but we're also reporting on device health and updating device firmware. So if anything's wrong with any of those devices, an administrator would be made aware. Now, in the, in the, back, in the back end of things, evidence is being uploaded to evidence.com and auto tags information from the agency's CAD RMS provider, something we've done with over uh, 15 different CAD RMS providers and hundreds of, of uh, law enforcement agencies. So now it's time to write the report. And from what we understand in talking to our customers, it's one of the most uh, time-consuming parts of the job. So Axon's really working to reimagine the records process by creating what we, what we feel is a truly officer-centric solution. Um, so things like uh, eliminating the need for double entry and or, uh, only showing data fields that pertain to that actual report. Just simple things that uh, should cut this report writing workflow uh, in half the time. So now it's that part of our story where the sergeant begins her involvement. Uh, her next step is to submit a completed case file to the DA. Before that, she uses redaction assistant, which uses uh, artificial intelligence to automatically recognize faces, MVT screens or computer screens, and license plates. So uh, previously, the time it took to redact a video was eight hours of redaction to one hour of video. We're getting that closer to a one-to-one -one ratio by automating a lot of this process. And I know Washington has, has specifically uh, more stringent redaction and not redaction, but uh, FOIA laws. So it's, it's something that should definitely be considered when you're uh, talking about deploying a body worn program. So that, with that redaction complete, with a click of a button, it's sent over to the DA. And typically, this is where the, U, the loop is effectively closed, but we're hearing that agencies are spending literally hours uh, uh, reviewing videos for performance and compliance checks. So to date, our sergeant would have to. Uh, export video IDs into Excel, use a randomizer, and then pick her five uh, videos for her monthly review. And that works, but there's really no way to tell uh, how, how well uh, compliance with the body-worn policy actually was. So using Axon Performance, our sergeant at a glance can see which calls for service are missing activation, uh, which officers might have a high or low activation rate, and what's the activation rate look like day-to-day, month-to-month, year-over-year. These are true stats that you can use to understand how well uh, adherence to the body one policy is actually going and how, you know, how well the money was spent essentially. So all that technology I just spoke about is a part of our officer safety plan seven plus. Now the reason we offer it in a bundle is for not only the inherent bundle savings that you see in other industries, but because the connectivity of those technologies and the way that I just walked through in that call for service, that connectivity is what drives the most value and benefit for our partner agencies. New for this year that we're adding to the officer safety plan, uh, Axon Auto Transcribe. So just by looking at it, it looks, you know, it sounds like it's a way to, to get transcriptions of video, which it is, but it, it, we take it a step further than that. Uh, something called Review Assistant. This is time synced transcription to the video. So say you're looking for the point in the video where uh, the guy says drugs or gun or calls, you know, uses profanity to address the officer. You can search for those words. It will take you to that exact moment in the video. So when it comes to review time on a video, this really reduces that, that time it takes. You don't have to watch the whole hour to understand you know, where the, uh, you know, the point of contention happened. Um, you can actually search for it and go directly to that spot in the video. 
The next step in the transcription uh, kind of roadmap is a digital notepad. This is a way for an officer to dictate his report into his body-worn camera, which is then transmitted over LTE, which is part of the camera, has an LTE uh, chip in it, um, and goes right to that, that officer's uh, MD, MDC so he can just copy and paste that report into his RMS system. So just really cutting down on the time it takes to do the report and let him get back on the street and doing police work. Now this is where we're gonna get into our virtual reality offering, which is which is really a part of our uh, taser, uh, taser side of the business. And that's where James comes in. I'll, I'll have him uh, talk through this part. Thanks, Alan, and, and, and thank you. As uh, Alan mentioned, uh, it's always nice to be able to be included in these type of presentations. And uh, we appreciate the, the time that you're giving us tonight. So um, Axon was known as a taser company for, for the last 25 years. We've been in the body camera market for about 12 years, the in-car and interview room market for a shorter period of time. And the one thing we realized was as a company that trains on taser deployments and de-escalation, the, the one thing that other markets similar to, um, well, in, in comparison to, to law enforcement, like medical and, and schools, we're using virtual reality and it was something that we were lacking. So about a year, year and a half ago, we launched a VR platform where we were trying to do um, basically community engagement trainings. And then we saw that the technology had evolved enough that we could move into simulator trainings. Um, so Alan, if you can go to the next slide for me. So, so basically like these are what's available in the marketplace today from a classroom role players, 2D screens, and then the VR side, which is what we're heavily focused on. And the, the big reason we're focused on the, the VR side is everything is captured within the headset itself. So we don't have the um, PC VRs, which are pretty heavy duty, um, basically PC machines in, in rooms. We're not taking up an entire room in an academy. Basically, we have the ability to put a headset onto an officer, hold back a team or teams at roll call, and then run them through different scenarios that basically uh, we believe through our consultants and just um, uh, last 25 years of experience um, will help solve some of the issues that agencies are having in their communities for uh, different scenarios. Uh, if you want to jump to the next slide, Alan. So we selected a um, HTC uh, Vive 3.0 headset, which basically has no affiliation with Facebook or any other social media. So this is going to be the headset that we are proposing that basically like I said, can be deployed rapidly. And it, as long as we have Wi-Fi, we're able to put this on to a officer or officers and run them through different scenarios um, in real time. Uh, next slide, please. So these are the two products that we're basically offering. Uh, community engagement training, as I mentioned, is um, if you guys remember, um, and I'm aging myself from the 1990s, reading a lot of books as a kid, um, but the choose your own adventure books where if you choose a certain path, it will have a certain outcome. And with our community engaged training, we are um, taking scenarios across the country that are impacting law enforcement. And we have the ability to run officers from the academy level to senior officers within the agency through different scenarios. And basically we are building a library of different scenarios with different outcomes. And the goal is to have officers walk through and be able to identify dementia or uh, Alzheimer's or um, schizophrenia or uh, someone who's, who's had too much to drink, suicidal individuals. And we are heavily focused because we believe with the, the fact that we have the body camera and, and obviously the taser weapon, which we've had for 28 years, that this is a huge focus that um, communities should be focused on. And we are very proud to bring it to our police agencies across just not, not only the US, but globally. And then the simulator training on our taser seven weapon, 
we have the ability where on the HTC 3.0 headset that we can do hand tracking. So we can actually do physical movements. Uh, and the reason I'm putting my hands in front of my face is when I bring them in front of the face of the HTC headset, it will virtually show my hands. And with the Taser 7, it will virtually show the Taser 7. So we can go to a firing range or we can walk them through a, a domestic violence um, scenario where we've built the technology that AI will dictate the conversation with that individual officer. But a trainer has the ability through an iPad that we provide. Um, basically, they can jump in and they can change the narrative of how that scenario is going. And then we can have different levels from beginner to expert so that we can start tracking uh, individual officers' um, choices that they make in both the CET and the simulator training. So we've started with domestic violence. We're talking about school shootings. We're talking about traffic stops. We're talking about homeless camps, all things that impact all communities across the country. And the simulator training basically is just going to allow uh, the agency to help further educate the officers as another part of their training that they're doing today. But we look at this as just another supplement to that. Uh, next slide, please. So this is what's available today in our community engagement training. So some of those uh, examples are available today. So the cadence that we're doing the community trainings on are once a month, we will be releasing a new um, CET or community engagement training. And we have upcoming releases that we're hearing about from agencies like Seattle and agencies like NYPD and Chicago. And these are just things that are on the roadmap today and we'll continue to build upon. So uh, again, the library will just continue to stack upon itself. So as we hire new officers, they'll have the ability to go back to the first training we did, as well as all the additional trainings that we provide over the next five year period. Uh, next slide, please, Alan. And then on the simulator training, uh, we have the domestic violence already built. We built a firing range, which is both for a Glock weapon as well as Taser 7 so that we can have just repetitiveness and then we can start just kind of tracking how officers are doing. And then in development, we have uh, the four scenarios that uh, you see three and then just additional scenarios that will be released on a every other month cadence as we believe that training is fundamental for um, agencies, for the communities, and for the police force. And uh, we're looking to support both, obviously, the officers as well as command staff and just providing additional context that uh, the taser weapon and the body cameras can help, you know, cap capture. So uh, next slide, please. I'll turn it back to Alan. Hey, that's with my slide. <laughs> Thanks, Dave. So yeah, I just wanted to have him run through that, you know, obviously, Officer training is at the forefront of uh, you know all the, the media we see these days, so we're, we're just trying to address it head on. Uh, from a customer experience standpoint, it's something I think is lacking in the public safety technology world. Uh, our support model, I, I feel, is unmatched in the industry. 24-7 uh, US-based support, everyone should have that, so that should be table stakes. I think right now we have it down to 30-second wait time. This is critical technology. We don't people, we want officers waiting on the phone to try to figure out how to work their malfunctioning camera or anything like that. Uh, we also have a customer success manager, something we took from the tech world as we transitioned to this uh, technology company. Uh, someone who can help you pull the most out of your investment, who can understand your day-to-day -day operations and how to wrap our technology around it. Uh, you also have an account manager, someone like myself, uh, who works with current customers that can help you explore other technologies that you might not have. And then finally, a sales engineer who uh, can address all the technical nuances that need to be understood as you deploy new technologies. A lot of it's networking based, but can be anything, and uh, that that seems great. So, just a, a whole host of support. Uh, we we don't like to leave our customers out in the cold, and, and it's a it's a big part of what we're doing these days. Now, I'm just going to dive a little bit into the the camera itself because I know that's kind of the the hot topic here. Uh, this is the Axon Body Three. It's our latest camera. It, it has uh, an LTE chip inside it that enables the GPS locating as well as the live stream functionality. Uh, I'm just going to run through a few quick spec slides so you can just understand. Uh, kind of what, what we're trying to accomplish with it. So embedded GPS, simple operation and display. There are literally three buttons on the camera. We're not trying to make it complicated. Uh, from a secure, security standpoint, we are best of breed. Uh, 
multiple mounting options. I think we have up to 20 mounts right now. So you can literally choose what works best for each officer. Uh, battery life is at the, the heart of everything. Without a, a battery, a camera is useless. Uh, so we, we build in uh, refreshes into our program so that the officers get new cameras at years two and a half and five uh, to address not only the battery issue, because lithium ion technology is only as good as it is, um, but also to get you on the latest greatest. So say you deploy AB3, at year two and a half, we're on AB4, you would then deploy AB4. So it just kind of builds that into the ongoing uh, program with no extra cost. And then rugged wearability. Like these are purpose-built devices. These aren't cell phones or uh, some of the other things you'll see out there. These are, are made to be uh, go into the wear and tear of a, of a law enforcement uh, officer's day-to-day, um, you know, whatever he might go through, which is, which is quite a lot. Uh, we, we constantly develop our, our technology, obviously. I'm going to show you um, how we address having better low-light performance. Uh, from our Axon Body 2 cameras on the left, Axon Body 3 is on the right. Both these cameras have the same resolution, um, but their light to dark ability is drastically different. So I'll let this video play. You can obviously see on the right, it adjusts much quicker um, than the one on the left. Now you're going to see a gentleman on the left there. You can't even barely see him on the left side. So this is all software driven. These are all software enhancements that we have uh, improved in the new camera. And this kind of speaks to our uh, dedication to always enhancing and, and, and bettering our current technologies. Another important part of a camera is the ability to pause video and get a, a clear picture of a face, a license plate, whatever it might be. Um, in this, also another video, we'll have Axon Body 2 on the left, Axon Body 3 on the right. You're going to see uh, a couple pausing moments. You can clearly see on the right this gentleman's face, where on the left it's still blurry. And again, same resolution. This is just enhanced uh, technology. Now, it's important to note that we're not trying to outdo the human eye. We're trying to show what the officer saw. So we're not trying to introduce things like infrared and, and uh, you know, being able to see in the dark, because that would, that would be not what the officer saw. So it's important that we're just giving a representation of what the officer saw when he was on scene. And again, there's, there's a quick picture of uh, that, the difference in the, the blur and the clarity on the right. Sound, that's obviously a big part of it as well. We went from a single microphone model on body two to a four microphone model on, um, on body three. And so with those four microphones, we can detect things like what, what is actually the, 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 the talking or the conversation versus what is traffic noise or wind noise or, or, or other uh, you know, background noises that could be going on. So um, again, continually developing the, the quality of the video through the devices. We spoke about it a bit before, but you know, you're able to act on real-time awareness, like it says here. Um, our Respond Plus platform allows that, that live streaming capability and GPS locating. Um, I think I have, on the left there, you can kind of see what the map that, that, a, that a, someone in command would be able to see. You'd see a couple cameras, and if they were recording, you would click on them and get that live stream going. So it's also important to note that it only does live streaming for cameras that are in the middle of recording. There's still some, uh, you know, police union and kind of big brother issues where we don't want people just, you know, jumping in on people's cameras. So we, we limit it to when the camera is recorded because that video will be viewed anyway. So what's the difference between live versus, you know, a couple hours later? Here's another quick video that's going to show on the right our gentleman, uh, one of our employees riding his motorcycle, and on the left uh, his, his location will update on the map. So, Again, it's all about real-time awareness, understanding where your officers are. Say he gets on a foot chase and gets lost, something we hear about all the time. Uh, you actually be able to give him instructions on where he is and how to get back to where he needs to be. So um, really just kind of doubling down on the, the real-time awareness aspect. And then finally, I believe this is the last slide, uh, Fleet 3, which is j just launched this month. It's our third-generation in-car camera. Um, it's, it's basically uh, our, last, our last fleet two system, but you know, kind of on steroids and just much better picture quality, much more uh, stable uh, infrastructure. It also has the ability to live stream, uh, kind of like the body cameras do. Um, and, and I don't believe uh, the PD is looking at this technology now, but in the future, if ALPR and every vehicle is something that you guys were interested in, uh, that, that is something that this system is capable of. Um, but that is the, the end of this kind of brief presentation. Didn't want to take too much time. Definitely want to allow time for questions if you have some. Oh, sorry. One, one second. This is important. One last slide. Axon signal. This is, uh, this is about, about activating cameras without, you know, 
doing it manually, which is a double tap on the button. Um, we can do things like, you know, like I mentioned on the, on the call for service walkthrough, turning on your light bar um, can do that, or opening, opening the rear door where the prisoner sits can activate a camera, uh, removing a gun, uh, the gun from the shotgun rack, um, but also things like arming a taser or deploying a taser or pulling out your, uh, your pistol out of, out of your holster. All those different things use our signal technology, which is really just Bluetooth technology. We keep it simple so that it works every time. Um, and those are all ways that you can activate body worn and in car video uh, without actually having to touch it yourself. Because obviously these guys are in the heat of the moment sometimes, and if they can have things recording automatically, that will obviously fare you know fare better for them in the long run. So that is the last slide for sure. So if there are questions, we'd love to love to take them. Yeah, Alan and James, um, thank you very much. Um, a lot of information <laughs> to it is, um, it is. for council to uh, to digest here in a very short period of time. So, uh, first, like that, Commander Stocker, do you have anything else you'd like to add before we take questions? Um, well, just one thing, I guess I can add real quick, um, without going into any detail. I can tell you that just in the last three to four weeks, I've handled two fairly serious complaints that came in. And one of them did not have any body cameras because our officers don't have body cameras. And we had some audio, uh, but it certainly would have been nice to have the body cameras because they were inside of a hotel room. The other incident that I looked into, um, our officers didn't have body cameras, but we had a couple officers from another agency that were there with us that had body cameras. And I had the entire video footage of the arrest. Um, and that was really, really super helpful um, to have that. Great, thank you. Uh, Councilmember Stearns. Um, thank you, Deputy Mayor. And um, yeah, th thank you for that presentation. I, I have like a ton of questions, but I'll just uh, start off with, uh, with two and then if there's time, I'll, I'll come back. Um, when, when you talked about, you know, not sort of being superior to the human eye, um, and maybe I, I was just wondering, um, what, what is the field of vision? for the axon and, and is i mean i'm assuming that's greater than the human eye so it's probably better is am i right about that and i'm sorry what was the question it was it, is it, it it cut out there i think field of vision oh field of vision i, see, I believe it's uh, 148 degrees so that that in and of itself is more than the human eye i guess well not i guess not necessarily um you know we're looking at we can almost see i think 170 degrees so it's it's pretty close to that um I was more speaking to like the resolution itself and picking up things in the dark, things like that. We're not trying to enhance video beyond what a human eye would see because the human eye is a pretty you know, amazing, amazing thing in and of itself. But uh, does, that, does that answer your question? Yeah, I mean, I, I think I mean, it, it just seems like it, it could be helpful, especially if, you know, there are instances which are not uncommon of like tunnel vision. So, you know, having that camera would, would you know, does seem to be good. Um, I, I, can, can you just sort of explain how the retention and storage process works? Yep, absolutely. So based on the categories that you would, you would uh, name in our evidence.com system, there'd be a retention period associated with each of those categories. So uh, it, basically once it was categorized, it would be subject to that category's retention period. Say somebody forgot or you know, auto tagging missed it or, for whatever reason, uh, it was never tagged and not categorized. It would it would never be uh, deleted because we, we don't know what you know what we would be deleting, right? So, um, the categories set up by you. If you said everything needs to be kept forever, we would oblige and just keep everything forever. Um, but obviously, it becomes more of a, a management issue on, on understanding how much data you have and everything like that. But again, it's all up to you. There's no limits to the storage on amount or time period. And, oh, um, I meant. I guess I was also really thinking. How is the how is the information downloaded? Is it all just under the cloud, or is it downloaded at the station? And when you mean downloaded, do you mean uh, so that the officers can view the video? Maybe I mean uploaded. You know, so the, the <laughs> video. Yeah, where does that exist? And yep. So it goes to it goes to the cloud. Microsoft Azure Gov Cloud is who we use as our uh, cloud provider. Um, and yeah, basically once it's up there, there are abilities to download. We actually recommend against it because once you do that, the audit trail disappears. 
Um, if everything is kept in the cloud from redaction to viewing to anything done to that video is kept in the audit trail forever. Okay, so it goes straight from the camera to the cloud. No other steps. Okay, thank you. All right. Yep. That's over Trump manual. Hi, good evening. Thank you, James and Alan. What a great presentation. I had uh, seen something similar to this in uh, Houston, Texas uh, at a National Leagues of Cities and it was uh, basically pretty close to what you were saying tonight. But I have two questions. Uh, once you, um, once you um, retact uh, the, the retection Protection. The officer puts his camera up and they download all the information and all the data goes to different categories. Is that what you said? And how do you, um, yeah, and how do you, you collect all of that information and who keeps it? So it could be done manually as far as labeling the videos, but we do have that auto tagging service that pulls information from your CAD RMS system. That, that, brings over, you know, the category, the officer, um, and basically the pertinent information uh, surrounding that video. But is your question about like, where, where does it go and who? who well, you it? mentioned that once you had it all put, put together, it goes before it goes to, then it goes to the prosecutor attorney. Okay, I think I see what you're saying. So we, we actually give uh, attorneys their own instance so that when you do share a video, it's then subject to their um, their category, or sorry, their category retention policies. Uh, whereas your video will always be yours. Like it will never leave the system. You would just be sharing a copy of it. Okay, okay. And then uh, how long does this video, um, does it stay from the time that the officer is on ship till the end? Does that stay on there until they d either download it or upload it to the system? Yep, typically we have officers wearing the cameras for their entire shift, whether it's 10, 12 hours or more. Um, and, and so it, it, it's basically in a recording mode all the time because it's capturing the first, and this is configurable, but the first 30 seconds or so prior to an event. So say something happens and an officer has to fire his weapon and then he hits his button. It'll capture the 30 seconds prior to him activating it. So. That way, it's basically always recording. Um, but yes, to answer your question, it's 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 carried and recording the entire shift. Okay, thank you for uh, answering my questions. Of course, Councilmember J. Raj. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. Um, gentlemen, that was a good presentation. Um, I have a couple of questions myself. Uh, I'm big on customer service. So um, yes. you are going to be representing a lot of PDs um, around the country, looks like it. Now, um, how do we interface with you on a regular basis and on an emergency basis? Uh, I hope it's not one of those where you call and an automated system comes on uh, and, and have to wait and dial the number again kind of a deal. Like we all do with every other technology that we own. Yeah. No, I definitely understand what you're saying. No, we are, um, and I, I, I touched on it briefly before, but we do not have an automated uh, answering service. It's, those are the real people, U.S. based, and our current wait time is 30 seconds. Like we don't believe that officers should, officers should be waiting on hold as they try to figure out, you know, their their critical technology. So, uh, from a pure support standpoint, in a in a kind of a, a tier one support, you have that that you know, phone number to call in and get a real person within 30 seconds. Uh, but you do also have kind of proactive uh, people that you can use, your customer success manager, your account manager, to talk about problems that you might be having or issues in the workflow that might be inhibiting their day-to-day, -day, things like that. Um, we, we work with you. We work very closely with our customers. We're on the road all the time. Uh, so in that, in that sense, we are proactively working with you to identify problems before they exist. Now, should they arise? We do have your traditional support model that would you know take care of it immediately. Yeah, and uh, how many? Um, sorry. Uh, um, 
Go oh. ahead. I, I was going to echo on uh, what Alan was saying. The, the average account manager has 35 accounts. So okay, that was my next question. I live in Oregon. I'm about two and a half hours south of you. And I work with agencies in Washington, Oregon, Colorado, and Idaho, and that's it. So from an account manager perspective, you have line of sight and then you have a customer success manager to Alan's point, who's in his or her entire role is to make sure your program is successful and you're using the uh, software that you're um, basically entitled to with the programs that you're uh, purchasing. And then from a, you know, weekends, overnights, um, you have 24 seven US based support. Okay, my, um, thank you. My next question has to do with uh, long-term effects of COVID found to affect heart issues with palpitations and myocarditis and pericarditis. How have they tested the, your equipment in light of these facts that there are effectively more normal appearing citizens who might who may inherently have suffered heart damage as a result of COVID infections. Are you referring to the taser or to the body cam? Taser. So the, the taser weapon, um, we're very proud to say is the most tested, less lethal device in the, not, not in the country, but in the world. Uh, there's been hundreds of studies done um, from researchers, from universities, and from um, third parties, uh, such as um, forensic science and, and others. And we'd be happy to provide a list of um, those, those research studies. Uh, we have never um, found a study. There's been 18 um, cases of, of muscle memory confusion on the weapon versus the taser. But um, typically, if a, a taser is involved in any type of case, we do a couple things. Number one, um, we have a, a liability insurance that covers agencies as far as uh, any type of litigation from a community member. But then number two, we have a, a, a legal team that's available to your um, city and police department that will help defend any type of case. Where, where we have seen some issues in the past have, have been more when someone's already uh, accelerated to delirium or someone who's, um, if we have someone who falls off a uh, building or a platform from a taser device being deployed. Um, but a big part of the training that we put officers through from uh, training uh, instructors as well as master instructors is to ensure that we're training the officers with the correct way to deploy in, in into the back or into what we call like splitting the belt, which would be into a thigh or stomach area. Uh, but we would be happy to provide you uh, a list of um, basically studies that have been done. And part of the officer safety plan is to include additional training, additional uh, inert cartridges, training cartridges. And uh, we include all of the training from a going to our actually uh, our schools that we um, over the like a five year period, we include all the training that an agency is going to require to ensure that those instructors and master instructors are up to date on our recommendations. And at the end of the day, like the policy of Auburn is Auburn's policy, but we will give guidance and uh, assist with that. So um, after the meeting, that'll be a follow up item that Ellen and I can follow up with is just a list of um, documents yeah. that you can go to just to kind of like read about that and uh, ensure that you're making the best decision for Auburn. That would be wonderful. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Council Member Baggett. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. Uh, good presentation, Alan and James. Uh, I had a question relative to uh, redaction. Uh, who or what actually determines the degree of redaction on the data that's that's uh, contained within these devices. So, are you, are you, do you mean who decides what to redact? Right. Yeah, I mean that that's that, that's also policy based, and it would be. I, I just met with uh, Denver Public Schools today, and that's a very sensitive subject since every video that they're going to have is going to have minors in it. So, it it will really just come down to what 
uh, your policy will dictate on the on the uh, redaction side of things. But typically, it would be any any face that wasn't involving uh, the suspect or the subject uh, under under suspicion. Okay. But it's mostly faces and also, also license plates and uh, we do we do uh, MD, MDC screens because say the uh, officer is sitting in his vehicle, we don't want to give up sensitive data from his terminal uh, on the video. So those are the three primary things: faces, license plates, and screens. So it's somewhat determined by the uh, agency itself, right? The, uh, the police agency. It is. It okay. is because you would even though the software would pick up the hey, this is a face or hey, this is a license plate, you would still confirm that you wanted that redacted. Okay. Thank you. Sure. That's what returns. Um, thank you again, Deputy Mayor. Um, so, uh, what what kind of um, I, I guess in public engagement or, or community involvement do you expect there would be with developing um, body camera policies? Well, I do know that every time a policy is created or uh, proposed, there's always public comment available um, surrounding that, or at least it's very common to have that. So it's it's definitely up up to the city. Um, and I've seen it go different ways uh, in cities and counties, um, but it would, it, you would, you would likely want it to be reviewed or say, Hey, this is, this is the draft we are proposing um, and see if anybody has any issues with it um, and stay ahead of that versus waiting till after. But it, you know, it, it's definitely up to you guys. Okay, great. Thank you. And, and then lastly, what, what is a, you know, a good, I guess I'm just curious, what, what's the contract cost? and the length for a law enforcement force of our size? For, so yeah, I typically work with agencies of your size between 100 and 150 sworn officers. Um, for an officer safety safety plan, and this is a little different because we're, we're adding in uh, interview room, we're adding in um, in-car video, but I, but I don't have it in front of me, uh, but I believe it's around 2.4 million over five years. Great, thank you. Councilmember J. Raj. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. I promise this will be my last question. <laughs> uh, so uh, this is a tough question uh, I need to ask. How many people have died from your tasers? I wanna say that is a tough question. And Councilman, I, I definitely respect the question because I think it's valid. Um, from a, a taser deployment, I would say zero, but from other circumstances, there's definitely a number there. Um, if you would allow me a couple of days to engage with our, um, we have a, a gentleman by the name of Steve Tuttle who's been with our company for the last 28 years and he's the principal of the taser product. So he's been involved with basically, he's what we call the wolf of Wall Street where he's collected everything and he knows everything about the company. Um, if you would allow me to respond to that in the next day or two, I'd appreciate it. And uh, we'll be very uh, open and uh, like, our company is uh, completely transparent and I'll provide uh, all details of what he provides. And then a direct line to Steve if you have additional questions about uh, that question. Thank you, James, I really appreciate that. Of course. Councilmember Brown. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. Um, yeah, my question pertains to a uh, probably two or three months ago, there was a use of force issue that uh, was in the national news relating to confusion uh, or alleged confusion between a taser and uh, the sidearm. And, uh, you know, I guess my question is. Is there any work, more work that needs to be done with respect to uh, ensuring the ability to differentiate or um, was that a, an anomaly based on maybe state of mind or something? I, I don't mean to speculate here, but uh, yep. could you comment on that? Yep, absolutely. Um, so the Brooklyn Center uh, shooting, which you're alluding to, uh, where a seasoned officer of 20 plus years had, uh, and she was a training officer as well, um, had her Glock drawn and in her verbiage yelled taser, 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 which is a very common 
um, analogy that we train for with our instructor schools as well as master instructor schools. And the, you know, unfortunately I can't say if she had confusion on the weapon. Um, I, I will say that our, like many, many years ago, uh, we had a, a, a weapon that if, if you look at my cell phone, was, it, was, it was similar to what there's a, a, something called the bolo wrap that's out right now that is held this way. And what we found when we actually introduced a taser very briefly back in the 1990s was we had officers who were pointing it and then shooting over the head of the suspect because it's a different uh, thing that then, than they're, what they're used to training on. And the Taser 7 is designed similar to a hand weapon in that it has a handle and it has a trigger, which is the same three pounds of pressure that uh, a service weapon would require. And what we have doubled down on this year is training. So we are providing additional inert cartridges, training cartridges, halt suits, targets, and then uh, basically our Accent Academy is all virtual now so that we're able to capture everything that a officer and an agency is going through from a training perspective. And then additionally, the virtual reality where we can actually put a officer through thousands of rounds of weapon draw that they're using his or her taser seven because the only change in the taser seven in the virtual world is the cartridge and in, in that what they're putting in so if you think about a taser we're basically removing live cartridges and putting in a what what we call a white cartridge and when they pull it up into that virtual world they're using their taser weapon that they're using in the field in the training scenarios so we recognize that like training is the fundamental thing that we need to be focused on. Um, I think in the Brooklyn Center event, it was, uh, that was one of the 17 cases that have happened over the last 27 years. Um, one of them that you hear about a lot is the Bart case, which um, led to a uh, prosecution of the officer. Um, but from a taser side, like we're doubling down on training and we are, you know, recommending agencies um, and I think probably commander, uh, the commander could talk to this or the chief could talk to it. Like we have something called weak draw or strong hand. And like, it's a policy that like whatever Auburn's using today is probably working because we haven't had that incident in Auburn. Uh, and we offer left-handed, right-handed holsters. Um, and whatever you're doing probably today is probably working. But um, the training part is the biggest thing that we're really focused on in 2021 moving forward. Um, and the Brooklyn Center event was just an unfortunate um, event and hopefully it doesn't happen again, but uh, just know Taser is very dedicated and acts on to transparency and training. And uh, hopefully we don't have that happen again. Thank you. Chief O'Neill. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. Um, I'll just add uh, the Auburn Police Department, we currently require our officers to uh, wear their taser on their weak side and it's a cross draw to help try and prevent uh, confusion between a firearm and a taser. Yeah, H highly recommended Thank by Axon. Thank you for that. Thank you, Jim. Um, So the question or statement I have is that um, body cameras um, have been controversial in some respects. Um, sometimes they're considered to be highly successful, other times considered to be not so highly successful. I'm just curious as to, might you say, the, the national take on this of the success rate in relation to the use of body cameras, how widely they are accepted by officers, and, um, and how well they do their job. You know, I'd say as, as things have as body worn camera programs have matured over the last you know, 10 years, like I, I live in California and they've been in California for a long time. Um, but but it, it's, it's definitely, the first indicator that a, that a program is working is the reduce in your uh, complaints right off the bat. You know, people will know that there's video and you know, automatically they're, they're not gonna press, you know, uh, they're not gonna kind of make, make, make uh, accusations that something happened that didn't. Right, because now they know there's video involved. So that that is that is number one. Um, but you're right; no technology is perfect. There's going to be instances where um, it doesn't help. But 
we're at, we're at a point in our uh, in society where it's going to be expected where every uh, criminal case or anything involving an officer, for that matter, uh, will video will be expected, right? And, and they'll say, well, if there's no video, then, will, then why wasn't there? Um, so I think you have kind of have to take the good with the bad. But if you talk to our, our customers, um, I've met with, you know, guys that have been with their respective PDs for 40 years and guys that have been there for four months. And the 40-year guys probably take a little longer to come on board because um, once they get, once, once they get a, a, you know, a false accusation thrown out, they're like, wait, that, that did help me. So now I'm, now I'm a fan. Um, as it pertains to the younger generation, the millennial generation, they expect this type of technology. They, they would tend to go to an agency that had this technology available to them because they think it would make them safer, they're tech savvy as it is, um, and it would just kind of fit with what they expect the policing job to be. So it, it's definitely a moving target and a dynamic situation. We're just trying our best to help uh, you know, both sides of the camera, but ultimately the officers um, who, are, who are getting falsely accused all the time and let them focus on, on what's important. So it's not a, a concrete answer, but it is a kind of a moving answer, if you will. That's very helpful. Thank you so much. Chief O'Neill. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. I was going to save this comment for the end, but uh, it seems appropriate now. Uh, first of all, James and Alan, thanks for being here with us tonight, and thanks for um, your great presentation. But I just wanted to add that our officers are very supportive of the idea of going to body cams. Um, it is something that they believe is going to uh, help protect them um, from those false uh, allegations that could occur. Um, and also, we believe that it's a, uh, an important tool to help uh, continue building that trust and transparency with our community. Um, and then uh, additionally, uh, it, it, at the end of the day, it seems like it's going uh, to be helpful and it, it's hard to really put a price on the value that we're gonna get from that trust and transparency with our community. Commander Stalker. Yes, thank you. I know it's going kind of long, but if I can just add, there was some discussion on policy earlier and um, we've had in-car video for, for quite a few years and we actually do have some body cameras on a few of our officers. Um, we have current best practice policies in place for in-car video and body camera video currently. Um, and if you haven't seen those policies, I'd be more than happy to get a copy for you. Appreciate that very much. I remember when I went on a ride along with one of the officers, um, he had the, on a few stops, of course, he had his um, vehicle camera on, you know, sitting in the cruiser and listening and hearing everything that was going on at that time. Um, it was very impressive because, you know, without that, it's just kind of a one-way conversation. But it was very interesting to see how that technology worked and, uh, and how it continues to evolve. Um, you know, some of us are still in the paper and pencil mode. As Alan said, some of us um, older folks uh, take a little while to get, uh, to get used to technology. But we're moving forward, and hopefully all of our officers will move forward as well. Uh, Chief O'Neill, once again. Yeah, sorry, one last thing I wanted to add. Uh, later on tonight, we're going to have a presentation talking about legislative reform. But uh, in one of the bills that was passed, uh, it's almost uh, a mandate to add body cams uh, to our police department. Uh, starting in January of 2022, we're going to be required to uh, record all custodial interrogations, both audio and video. And if uh, we don't have a uniform technology across the board for that, it's going to create a... Uh, public records nightmare, and it's going to make it uh, extremely difficult to have 118 people using the same technology uh, with the same files to present all those cases or all those files that we need for prosecution or public records. Great. Thank you for that. Um, this has been very interesting, um, excellent presentation. And um, James and, uh, and, and Alan, um, you've given this council a lot to consider and to think about and uh, in continuation of our support of our officers and the work that they do every day out in the streets of Auburn. So thank you very much for your presentation. Uh, Commander Stalker, thank you. And Chief O'Neill, thank you. And we'll hear from you later. Appreciate the time you've given us this evening. Thank you guys. Thank you. Okay, council next on our agenda is the first quarter 2021 financial report with Director Thomas. Thank you, Deputy Mayor DeCourcy. Um, I'm going to 
um, lighten up the topic a little bit, hopefully, and talk about the first quarter 2021 financial report. Um, it's still early in the year. We're only into the first quarter as far as our financial records are ready for reporting out to the council. So um, hopefully this will be a little bit more brief than um, some of our other quarterly reports where we're looking at um, more of uh, more activity throughout the year. Uh, this report um, is a much more uh, detailed presentation that um, begins on page 48 of your council packet, but I sent the condensed um, PowerPoint presentation earlier. Um, I'm going to share my screen now for the PowerPoint. And it is. Not popping up. I see it on my computer, but I don't think you guys are seeing it on your end. Here it is. Sorry about that. All right. So this page is a summary. Um, this slide is a summary of a much more detailed information that you'll see on page 50 of your agenda. Um, I'm only going to go over um, some of the detailed trend information for some of these items. Property tax is trending higher um, compared to our budget as well as our um, comparison to the prior year, but that's, um, that's we're not gonna collect more than we levied. And we know that we levied more than 2020. So um, the variance between budget and um, prior year is expected. Um, sales tax, we are um, ahead of our budget um, by almost $920,000. So we'll look at that a little bit more. Uh, our utility tax is trending lower than budget of $395,000. So we're going to look at that a little bit more. Building permits um, is up $245,000, which is pretty significant compared to the overall budget amount for building permits. So we'll look at that, um, as well as intergovernmental revenue is a little bit less than um, our year to date expected of 290 or two, it's $296,000 less. So we'll kind of break down some of the pieces of that to see what is um, what are the factors there as well as our charges for services are a little bit lower than we would have expected um, this at this point this year. So we'll look um, again details into that a little bit more. So first we'll jump into retail sales tax because that is the most significant um, revenue source as well as really the most significant variance um, in our year to date um, budget versus actual right now. We're trending $398,000 over the prior year, but I do want to remind um, the Council that these, this reflects November 2020 through January 2021 data which um, when we're comparing to the prior year, that's November 2019 to January 2020. So the prior year data does not include COVID impacts yet. Um, so really the $398,000 over prior year is a pretty good comparison um, of a non-COVID activity compared to current activity. And we're at eight and a half percent over um, that pre-COVID activity, which is a pretty good indicator of um, economic, um, or just kind of the, um, the sales tax activity taking place um, in Auburn. And which is why our um, we're over our anticipated year-to-date budget of $920,000. Um, if you recall, when we put together our 2021 and 2022 biennial budget, we built our 2021 figures based on um, a recessionary, we were assuming a recession would take place. So we started with 2019 actuals that we collected in sales tax in 2019. And then we built in a little bit of a recessionary model because we weren't quite sure back in September of last year, how COVID was going to impact our economy. And clearly there, a recession hasn't hit as of yet in the first quarter, our sales tax activity remains pretty strong really in um, all sectors at this point which brings me to the next page the next 
uh, slide, which is the retail sales tax by sector. So we can see which sectors are overperforming or which ones are um, lagging behind a little bit. Construction sector is $123,000 favorable compared to the prior year. That continues to be um, a very strong sector. Again, I've got to um, give a lot of credit to our um, building development team um, who continue to really work with developers and contractors to make sure that permits got out, um, out of the door, which then leads to um, actual construction activity in the city. And then we in turn get that sales tax back um, from those projects. Um, transportation and warehousing, I, I do want to point this out. It's only $62,000 ab um, above 2020, but it's a really small sector. So that $62,000 is actually a, a pretty significant bump um, if you're looking at 2020 to 2021. And it's really interesting. It is um, related to courier services, which are like your Uber Eats and your DoorDash, um, your Instacart. So it's, it's really interesting how um, a very uh, niche industry um, has had a, a pretty significant impact really on our, our sales tax collection. Uh, automotive industry, um, the 2020 change versus 2020 um, performing pretty strong. Again, this is the 2020 figures are pre-COVID um, figures um, and um, we are, are overperforming um, those pre-COVID conditions of 2019, uh, towards the end of 2019. Retail trade is uh, doing very well compared to 2019. So it looks like we they've recovered a little bit, at least from the summer months and some of the um, closures or at least the partial closures. Um, and then the really the big, like there's a couple of subsectors within that retail trade that are, are holding up that, that sector, which is your building materials. So your Lowe's, Home Depot, probably, um, uh, even uh, manufacturers that just uh, um, that sell retail building supplies to consumers, uh, as well as Amazon is a big contributor in that in that line item as well. General merchandise stores and home furnishing stores. So those are really the four subcategories in that retail trade sector that are contributing to that 140,000, almost 141,000 dollar increase over the prior year. So moving into utility tax, because there's a lot of um, interesting things taking place in the utility tax curve. If you're looking at the graph um, to the left, um, the gray box looks a lot different than the uh, black dotted line compared to the black solid line. So what's happening here is just to, as a, to remind um, council that we really have two types of utility taxes that are contributing to this line. And that is our external utilities tax that we charge 6% on external utilities telephone, cable, and electric, um, and natural gas. And then we've also got our city's internal um, utilities, which we uh, impose a 7% tax on our, our water, sewer, storm, and solid waste utilities that the city provides. So we are $345,000 under budget because um, this is really primarily related to our city utilities. But our water consumption um, from our big customers, primarily our commercial and manufacturing customers, still is a little bit behind, um, especially compared to 2020, same time this year. And because our water and sewer revenues are down, that means the tax tied to that revenue is also lower. Interestingly enough, we're actually overperforming the prior year, and that is because we had increased our, our internal utility tax rate, as you may recall, during our biennial budget process. So last year at this time, we um, were collecting um, uh, 6%. Uh, we were collecting 6% on our city utilities, and now we're collecting um, 9%. So there is, I have a a, a typo there on the internal utilities that says 7%. We actually are loving 9% on our internal utilities. We do actually charge a total of 10%. 1% goes to arterial streets. 9% goes into our, um, our general fund. I apologize for that. So that's why that graph is a, a little bit different. We'll, we'll talk, I'm gonna talk a little bit more about the water, sewer and storm uh, revenue performance um, towards the end of this presentation. And we can talk about what the projections and how that would impact our utility tax through the end of the year as well. So building permits, 
even though overall in the general fund, it makes um, a, a smaller percentage of our total general fund revenues, because this activity drives so many other things um, for the city and because it's overperforming um, both budget and prior year, I think it's a, an important thing to be keeping our eye on just to kind of give us an idea of what we may expect um, in the future. Um, right now, we are $245,000 over budget with the building permits that we have collected and $202,000 over the prior year. And that's really related to um, the total number of permits that we have issued so far in quarter one was 132 versus the 106 permits issued in quarter one of 2020. And 63% of those permits are attributed to um, commercial activity. In addition, we have a couple of very large um, commercial projects um, with larger permit values also increasing the total revenue that we've collected. And we'll see in a couple of places throughout um, the financial report further along in the slides where this building permit activity is also, um, has also led to increased revenues in other revenue streams as well. Our intergovernmental revenue, um, we've collected a total of $675,000 year to date. Um, that's 651,000 below last year, year to date, and it's 296,700 under our um, year to date budget. So a reminder that the revenues in the inter intergovernmental uh, category include um, our grants from state, federal, and interlocal sources, our Muckleshoot Indian Tribe Compact Agreement that we have, as well as state shared revenue. State shared revenue include, included streamlined sales tax, motor vehicle excise tax, and our marijuana and liquor excise tax, and our criminal justice sales tax. Um, I say included streamlined sales tax because again, um, that, that mitigation money had been um, repealed um, early last year. It has been reinstated, but we have not received our um, our distribution yet for that streamlined sales tax, and we haven't done a budget amendment yet for that in 2021. So the reason why we are under 2020 really has to do with two pieces: um, the timing of collection on our um, compact agreement with the Muckleshoot Indian Tribe, as well as the elimination of the streamlined sales tax. So in 2020, we did collect one quarter's worth of streamlined sales tax, but we have not received any yet this year. So that is contributing to a pretty large variance between last year and this year. And then the reason why we're under budget is because as of the time, um, as of the end of the quarter one, we had not received our first quarter um, uh, compact payment from the, the tribe. Um, taking that, pay we have since received it. If we take that payment into consideration, we're actually on track to be above budget in the intergovernmental um, revenue category. Charges for services, um, there's four main uh, governmental or four main categories that we collect revenue for in the charges for services. That's general government, public safety, development services, and culture and recreation. The general government um, services really are just inner fund charges that the general fund charges all of the other funds for finance, HR, and legal services. Um, finance, HR, and legal services are all paid 100% out of the general fund. Um, through the budget process, and then we allocate those costs back to all of the other departments. Uh, what we charge back to the other departments budget-wise is based on the total cost um, that we budgeted for, and but what we actually charge out is based on um, the actual cost. So we actually have some attrition and staffing turnover in those departments, so therefore we're not necessarily charging um, the full allocation um, then which reduces the revenue that we collect for general government. On the flip side, we also have salary savings then in the, in the general fund because of that turnover and attrition. Public safety is um, also below budget. Um, the, this is almost completely attributed to the overtime that our police department provides for private business. And the reduction is um, attributed to the timing for the billing of services, but it's also because it, we bill for the services rendered. If there's been a reduction in actual services, there then there's nothing. There would be nothing to bill for. So, um, between the, the timing and between just reduced activity, um, we are currently below budget. 
Um, as I mentioned earlier on the building permit side, that drives a lot of revenue, other revenue streams, and that is the case for the de development service fees. So we have building permits and those generate plan check fees as well as facility extension charges and zoning and subdivision fees, which that revenue is accounted for in this development services um, piece in our charges for service. So really all the same projects that we're driving increased uh, building permit revenue also is driving an increased development service revenue that we've collected through charges for services culture and recreation is currently below budget primarily the revenues in this category of green fee are green fees at the golf course recreational classes special events and senior center programs and um, in the first quarter uh, we had COVID restrictions that either limited or um, restricted the opening of a lot of those programs still. So we still had reduced revenue streams for a lot of those special programs. And 64% of the revenue that we did collect was actually related to green fees. Um, at this point, based on how well our green fees performed last year and knowing that we have a lot of our recreational department programs opening back up um, in um, the third and fourth quarter, of 2021, I would expect that we'll, we're more online with um, either finishing at budget or above budget by the end of the year. So some other revenue streams outside of the general fund, but there are still significant and indicators of some of the things that are going on in the city are our real estate excise tax. So that is on the sale of all real property. We get a portion of um, tax on that and it's the RCW restricts the use of that um, excise tax um, to very specific general governmental capital purposes. And we use it um, for a lot of one-time projects that are allowable um, by the RCW. We budgeted $1.9 million in 2021. And as of March 31st, we had already collected $995,000. So we had collected half of our year's anticipated real estate excise tax in just the first quarter, um, which is $111,000 over the prior year, year-to-date budget, and it's $510,000 over the um, current year-to-date budget. That's really just a reflection of the real estate market um, for houses, but also some large uh, commercial transactions that have taken place. Um, there was a sale of a storage facility and a couple, um, and a sale of a large multifamily complex. And so it's, those, the, it's the tax generated on those really large sales that really drive um, the, the significant changes in that real estate excise tax. Then we have transportation and park impact fees. These are also two other revenue sources that are tied um, pretty strongly to our building permit activity. Um, certain building permits will require developers to pay um, impact fees. And we also, these impact, these both transportation and park impact fees are used for the city to enhance our current system that um, are required just based on the additional developments um, taking place. And so again, a couple of really large projects um, have resulted in some um, more than expected transportation and park impact fee collections. Um, we've collected $980,000 this year. Um, on transportation impact fees, which is um, $871,000 over the prior year, year to date, and uh, $776,000 over our year to date budget. And our park impact fees are performing better than budget and better than prior year, not as strong as the transportation impact fees, but also um, very healthy. And, and where this is important is when we're considering um, some of our park and road enhancement programs and trying to find funding for those enhancements, um, we rely really heavily on these impact fees to be able to fund um, some or a portion of those projects. And I wanted to come back and talk a little, kind of look at the water revenues um, a little bit more closely only because we have seen the consumption change um, through 2020 and now into 2021 and they're impacting our utility tax revenues that I had mentioned earlier. Um, we collected $22 million so far year to date in versus the $2.7 million that we had collected um, last year um, through the first quarter. And it's really because the uh, 
because wastewater uh, revenue is also tied to water consumption with the reduced water consumption for commercial manufacturing accounts um, has dipped. It's actually decreased about 3.2% over the first quarter of last year. Um, we just have our net, our net operating income for all three of the utilities in total is, is a little bit lower. Um, I did want to point out though, on the graph on the left, you can see if you're looking at the blue dotted line, you can see where that water consumption dipped in the first part of um, 2020. Um, it started to dip there in February and March, and then it slowly started to pick up. Um, and we, we started to peak then again in August, September, October, which we normally expect to see an increase over the summer months. Um, and now we're seeing a pretty flat consumption line, that solid blue line between January and March, which is an indication that we're, we're starting to pick up a little bit um, and hopefully uh, get to consumption as normal as we get into um, the second and later half of 2021. And that was a lot of numbers. <laughs> um, do you have any questions for me? Questions for Jamie Council. Not seeing any hands raised, Jamie. I do have to see a hand raised. Oh, okay. Council Member Trout Manual. Yes, Jamie. Thank you, Deputy Mayor DeCorsi. Jamie, could we have those last few slides uh, that you presented with all the figures on the side? Um, yes. The water I, and the... Um, yep. My share screen got turned off. So I got to get my screen back. The last four. I would really appreciate it. Yeah. I'm going to, I think I'm going to have to, and I sent, there we go. I sent the presentation um, a couple of hours ago. Can you guys see my PowerPoint presentation again? Okay. Yes. All right. There we go. Is this the one you're, this one? Well, there's four back in that one. Yes. This one? Yes. There Did really you have a question about it? Uh, no, I just wanted to have it uh, so I can refer back, you know, later on. Okay. If I, um, if you need me to resend the, the presentation, the full presentation, um, I can go ahead and do that, but you should have that, all these, this information available to you also outside of this. Outside okay. Of this. If you would, if you would send the whole, that would be nice. Thank yeah. You. I'll resend that to you. Yep. Of course. Also, Mr. Stearns, you had a question? Um, yeah, uh, thanks, Jamie. I was just wondering if you could go back to the um, overview slide. At the very beginning? Yes. Right here? Yeah, if you could just uh, briefly ex explain the um, expenditures part. Oh, yeah, sure. Um, so that is... So that's all the departmental expenditures as well. Um, we have a couple of, um, our score is in there. So that's our score jail. We don't have um, a lot of uh, flexibility in that. That is a contracted payment. But what you'll see is um, we've budgeted $19.9 million in um, year to date expenditures. That's not our total annual budget. And we have underspent about $2.2 million. Um, this, there's a couple of things going into play there. One, we generally just through normal attrition and turnover, we do expect to see underspend in our um, total expenditures. But also, if you recall, um, we had a, several hiring freezes um, during 2020 for COVID. And so we had a huge hiring kind of bump at the beginning of January and in, in the first quarter to get up to full staff again with those hiring freezes. So in that first three months, not all of those salaries, even though budgeted, there weren't actually necessarily people in those positions yet. Um, we will probably see a little bit of catch up as we get later into the year after we've um, hired new people and gotten those folks on board. Okay, great, thank you. Mm -hmm. 
Any other questions for Jamie Council? Okay, Jamie, thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, Council, um, now we're gonna be moving into our municipal services discussion and Councilmember Jay Raj will be running this part of the meeting, but I would like to make a suggestion. Uh, I would like to have Councilmember Jay Raj go ahead with the item 4A, the police advisory committee update. And then once that complete, James, if we could take perhaps a five minute break after that and then reconvene uh, for parts 4B and 4C. Councilmember Jay Raj. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. Um, at this point, uh, I am going to turn uh, the Police Advisory Committee update to uh, Chief O'Neill. Thank you, Councilmember Jay Raj. Again, good evening, uh, Mayor and members of City Council uh, tonight. Also joining me from the PAC, uh, who will speak in a few minutes is Jessica Hess. She's the District 6 representative. Thank you, Chief. Good evening, council members. Uh, okay. Um, we're having some technical difficulties with the PowerPoint here. Give us a second. All right, sorry, I'm, I'm not sure the PowerPoint's gonna work. If I can Chief, just, we, we can, I can see it on my screen. I know, I'm, I'm trying to go to the next slide though. Okay, okay. And it's not working. Oh, there we go, it went to the next slide. There we go. All right, so if you recall, the uh, last pack update we gave was in February. Um, we've uh, agreed to give an update each quarter. Uh, since then, the Police Advisory Committee has been very busy working on several initiatives. Um, if you recall, one of the three um, goals of the Police Advisory Committee was to reduce officer-involved shootings to zero. Uh, so as a way to do that, we're looking at less uh, lethal alternatives. Uh, Commander Adams brought in a, a demonstration of the BOLA wrap for us. Uh, we looked at that as uh, a committee and decided that that is a less lethal tool we want to try and get for our officers. Um, so there was a budget amendment uh, submitted for that. Uh, so that our officers have another less lethal option out there in the field. Uh, we also talked about creating a community service award. Um, while we were talking about uh, Asian American violence, uh, some of the members of the PAC brought up that we really need members in our community to interject or intervene when we see others doing things that we don't accept or don't tolerate as a community. Um, one of the concerns that came out of that though, was that the violence might be redirected towards anybody that tries to intervene. Uh, so something that the PAC decided they wanna do to try and uh, set expectations of behavior in our community and what we expect of one another is to recognize uh, members of our community who do interject and stick up for others when they are being targeted. Uh, and so to do that and reinforce positive behavior uh, we are working on creating a community service award. Uh, this community service award won't be presented by the police department. It'll actually be from the police advisory committee. Uh, and so we're in the process of creating a subcommittee right now who's gonna work on that award. Um, another thing that we are working on uh, as a committee, and I just signed the agreement last week with Green River Community College, or I'm sorry, Green River College. It was Green River Community College and I attended a long, long time ago. But I just signed an agreement with them to create a scholarship foundation. Uh, we recognize uh, the need to recruit and retain uh, good police officers and the importance of getting police officers from our community. Uh, so to create a recruiting pipeline from the Auburn School District or members of the Auburn community into the Auburn Police Department, uh, we established a scholarship foundation uh, for members of the community that want to um, major in criminal justice at Green River College. So hopefully that'll be in effect and we will issue our first scholarship uh, for fall quarter. Uh, another topic of conversation that we focused on 
uh, was the legislative reform. Uh, we're going to hear a lot about that uh, after this presentation tonight. Um, we are also looking at creating the Auburn Police Foundation. Uh, the cities of Bellevue and Bothell have similar programs. Uh, last year in a COVID year, I believe the city of Bellevue was able to raise around $235,000. Uh, and the idea of creating an Auburn Police Foundation through the Police Advisory Committee would be to use those funds for training that members of the PAC want to see Auburn police officers get or to purchase uh, other less lethal options or other pieces of equipment um, that they want our police officers uh, to have access to out there on the streets. Um, we are also talking about um, if we can grow it like we would uh, like to, uh, using those funds to maybe pay off student loans uh, down the road for um, Auburn residents that complete four years of college and then come and work for the Auburn Police Department. Um, another idea that we've added since February is we've added police liaisons for each member of the PAC. So each member of the PAC now has two police officers in the department that they are connected to uh, that they can reach out to with questions. Uh, they can email them. I know some of them have met for lunch, some of them have met for coffee, and others have gone on uh, ride-alongs. Uh, I know Jessica has had the opportunity to meet with her liaison, and um, she's going to tell us a little bit about that in a minute. Um, last month, we had the grand opening of the community court, and two members of the police advisory committee attended that. Uh, there's also some issues going on on uh, Lee Hill right now with a uh, residents associated with uh, criminal activity, and we've had members of the police advisory committee that live on Lee Hill uh, working with that group and sharing information between the uh, police department and the community. And then uh, lastly, um, some members of the PAC have attended uh, some police training so far uh, this year. Uh, that's kind of got um, a little unorganized as we had to change things as the restrictions for COVID have been lifted and improved, um, but we will be working on a new schedule for the second half of the year uh, to get members of the PAC into police uh, training. And then uh, things that we're working on next are the Auburn Police Department now has a public information officer. Uh, we're going to work the PIO into the PAC so that we can work on uh, getting our minutes posted, uh, notes from each meeting so they're more readily available to the community. Uh, the PIO is also gonna work with each member of the PAC um, so that they can be uh, introduced and accessible uh, to the diverse group that they lead within our community. Uh, and at this time, I want to turn it over to Jessica so she can share her experiences uh, with the PAC so far. Hi, good evening, council members and mayor. Thank you so much for having me here. Um, I just want to say that I really love to be in the PAC. It's overall a very positive experience. Uh, we all respectfully communicate with each other. It's open discussion. We don't always see eye to eye, but when we don't, we take votes. Um, it's really good because we have different points of views and um, I feel that we're all very open-minded. I am proud to be in this committee because we really are making a difference and it makes you want to do more, to be more involved. And um, it's very educational. And like I said, uh, if I could only describe it in one word, it would be positivity. Because like Chief said that we are making uh, subcommittees. As far as um, the one about recognizing citizens, I really think that that's gonna take off because it will make people think like, what, what more can I do? How more can I be involved? And an incentive, a motivation to be recognized by your peers. I think that that's huge because a lot of people nowadays, they're just focusing on the negative and that's all you hear about, but it's time to hear about the positive. It's time to make a change. And so I really, really like that. Um, also, another thing is that 
in this committee, we are leaders, we're not being led. For example, when we have topics and we kind of don't know which way to go and somebody might ask chief, hey chief, uh, can you kind of guide us? Instead of doing that or uh, kind of navigating us, he gives us the tools and uh, tells us to do our research and gives us homework. And then that way we can make our own decision. We're not being led, we are the leaders. And I think that that's really huge. Um, as far as my liaisons, I have two. And I've gone on to police rides with them. I was so impressed with, uh, number one, how much they really care. For example, um, I was on a police ride and there were some children that, you know, it hurt my heart to see these children in this condition. And uh, the policeman told me that he was familiar with this family. He goes and he hangs out with them. He plays football with them. You know, they know the members of the community. They spend time where they're needed. They show face and show that they are accessible. I think that's really big. Um, as far as my two liaisons, I have complete access to them. Um, I can reach them at any time. And the biggest thing that I got from my ride-alongs is that we bounce ideas off of each other. Okay, can okay. Um, we bounced ideas off of each other about like what can we do to improve? Um, what would you like to see? And that kind of thing. And I think it's so huge to have a liaison because, like I said, it's two completely different perspectives. One of being a citizen just living here, and two of them really being involved in the community, community, seeing what's going on. And to come together, that's a powerful connection right there. Um, I was also, I wanted to comment that I was very impressed with the teamwork of the police. Um, when they all showed up together, each of them knew their role, knew what to do, and just uh, really came together as a team to uh, take care of all of the calls. And I was very impressed with that because um, I used to work in trauma clinics at Harborview. And it was always chaotic, but seeing this team, even in uh, stressful situations, they really are a positive, strong team that know each other, like each other, rely on each other and come together. So overall, being in the pack has been nothing but positive uh, for me. And um, the main thing is that I see that we are making a change, we are being heard. And like I said, it's just more, it's just motivating to want to do more and be more involved. Thank you. Thank you, Jessica. Uh, are there any questions at this time? Council Member Stearns. Um, thank, thank you, Chief. Um, thank, thank you, Jessica. That sounds like a really uh, amazing experience. I asked this question of, of the last um, committee member who um, uh, spoke to us. And, and that was just simply, um, since you're an advisory commission, um, have you come up with any recommendations or advice for the police department? Yes, I have. Um, I follow a policeman in on Instagram who is in Arkansas. And uh, it's a white policeman. And, you know, Arkansas is predominantly uh, with black people. And so what he does is he goes out into the community and he gets donations and of like bags of chips and sodas and stuff like that. And he just sits somewhere and people approach, mainly the children, approach him and he hangs out with them and he talks to them and it's a positive experience. And I think that it's so huge to start with the children because, you know, the parents are kind of like a little leery about police. And so if they see that the children come back with, oh, mom, he was so nice and he's so easy to talk to and that kind of thing. And um, it just, if you start with the children and then you reach the parents, it's just, you're reaching everybody in the community. So I did say, hey, we should do something like that. And also as PAC members, we could ride along with the police and um, 
be a part of that as well. And I think that it's easier for citizens to relate to another citizen uh, to say, okay, well, she's or she or he is okay with that. And okay, if they're trusting it, then maybe I should and that kind of thing. I just think that it's important to really get to know each other because before I was in this committee, you know, I didn't know the police at all. And I kind of just thought, oh, they're serious, kind of unapproachable, that kind of thing. But now that I'm in this committee and getting to know them, it's like, I'm seeing that they want to know us just as much. And I, I have uh, recommended that to my liaisons and said, hey, I'll go with you. Let's get the no donations and let's go into the community and make a positive difference. Wow, that, that's fantastic. Thank you so much for your Thank insight. you. Councilmember Jay Raj has a question. I'm leading this anyway. I can ask the question. <laughs> <laughs> I, I know. I, I, uh, I feel like I committed a uh, foul when I, uh, when I called on Councilmember Stearns, and I was like, "Oh, this isn't how that meeting works." So I apologize. Uh, not a problem. Not a problem. Um, so, um, Jessica, thank you for your presentation. I really, really enjoyed it. Um, uh, and Chief, uh, thank you very much as well. Uh, I am seeing positivity. Is uh, is what I'm going to say. Um, and it uh, seems like the uh, PAC is giving us ideas and uh, from their lived experiences. And uh, Jessica, that was a very good uh, example that you gave. And uh, I am very uh, heart warmed at this point. Uh, so uh, I hope you guys do great things in our city and uh, I will, uh, encourage you to keep on doing what you're doing. Thank you. Thank you so much. That means a lot. Um, Council Member uh, Trot Manuel. Thank you, uh, Council Member Jerry Uh Jessica, thank you for stepping up and uh, becoming a PAC advisory um, and great ideas that you suggested <clears throat> at our Regional Law and Justice Committee. Um, one of our council members from Bato came up and he said how much they have been doing their, in their city. And their approach was going to the children, going to um, where kids were playing basketball and our police officers would join in. And uh, they gave, they had a program that they had baseball cards and they were giving the baseball cards to, to kids. And, and you're right. You approach the kids, the kids go back home and they do tell their parents, they're not like what you're saying they are. And, and I think that that's great that our, you suggested that to our city um, police officers because it's, it's gonna, it's just gonna grow. So thank you for serving on this pack. Thank you so much. Any other questions? If not, I'm gonna turn it back to um, Deputy Mayor DeCorsi. Oh, hold it. Hold it. Council member Larry Brown. I was a little slow on the draw, but thank you very You're much. You're always very slow. <laughs> <laughs> well, I just want to uh, you know, thank Jessica for the work she's doing on behalf of our community. Uh, this is the kind of thing that makes us a city uh, that is people would be envious of living in. And uh, your contributions uh, are really appreciated. So thank you mu so much for the work you're doing. Thank you so much for saying that. It means a lot to me and to us. Once okay. again, thank and you, Jessica so and um, uh, Chief O'Neill. Uh, Deputy Mayor, you have it. Thank you, Council Member Jarrah. and Jessica, I echo my fellow council members. Thank you for your service and all you're doing for our community. Thank okay, you. Council, it is 7.30. And let's take a five minute break, return at 735. So we are recessed until 735.
Hey, James, we'll just wait till we see a few more cameras turned on here. Okay. Um, okay. All right. We'll call this meeting back to order. And uh, Councilmember J. Raj, please continue. Thank you, Deputy Mayor. Um, once again, I am going to turn this uh, the 2021 legislative update related to policing over to uh, Chief O'Neill. Thank you again, and again, good evening, Mayor and members of City Council. Uh, we have a presentation here for you. Again, my name's uh, Dan O'Neill, I'm Chief of Police. Uh, this is gonna be a, a lot of information to uh, process and take in. Uh, that we're going to throw at you over the next 45 minutes. Uh, so if you have questions or comments, please don't hesitate to shoot me an email or uh, give me a call there. Uh, and in May of 2021, uh, there were 13 bills that were signed into law by the governor's office related to police reform. Uh, the four biggest bills that are going to impact policing the most are the tactics bill, use of force, uh, the Blake decision, and duty to intervene. Some of the other key bills include uh, impeachment disclosures, audits during independent investigations, uh, electronic recordings, juvenile access to attorneys, uh, independent investigations, um, protection orders. Also new decertification laws for officers that engage in misconduct, uh, grievance and arbitration panels, and law enforcement data collection. As a result of these bills, as you look through a lot of them, uh, they're gonna have a significant impact on the way that we uh, police our community. Um, and some of those changes are going to include uh, potentially more online reports, um, officers spending more time uh, at scenes, which could potentially stretch our resources uh, thinner. Uh, it could require us, as we talked about earlier, to acquire body cameras. And it's also, uh, it may require us to potentially walk away in certain situations uh, and not make a physical arrest if there's not an imminent threat of bodily harm or injury to another person. Some of the research that we found while preparing for this presentation tonight, and also this information was just released by WASPIC last week with their uh, latest crime report. But Washington currently ranks 50 out of 50 in the United States for law enforcement officers per capita. And if you include the District of Columbia, we're 51 out of 51. Uh, since 2012, the Auburn Police Department, which has always had the full support of our mayor and council, has operated consistently within Washington state standards of maintaining an average of 1.4 officers per 1,000 citizens. At this time, I'm now going to turn this presentation over to our city attorney's office so that they can provide a legal analysis of each of those bills. And good evening, uh, Mayor and, and Council. I hope that uh, every, everybody can hear me okay. Deputy City Attorney Harry Boucher here. Um, the first uh, bill that we'd like to discuss in greater detail with you is what's called 1054. This is a police tactics bill that takes effect July 25th. Uh, the primary things that uh, this bill does is it uh, bans the police use of chokeholds and, and neck restraints, um, which are also called uh, um, VNR uh, neck restraints. Um, the other thing that it does is with the Criminal Justice Training Commission, it establishes a, a work group um, to formulate additional policies related to police use of canine officers. It also um, adds additional guidelines and restrictions on the use of uh, tear gas and restricts the use of what they define as military equipment and restricts vehicle pursuits. That's a, a, a major 
piece of this bill as well. Under this uh, bill, officers can pursue a vehicle uh, if they have probable cause, only if they have probable cause to believe that a person's committed either a violent offense or a sex offense, as our state law defines it, or if they have reasonable, reasonable suspicion to believe that the uh, an occupant of the vehicle is committing a DUI. And so what are our impacts of this bill? How is it gonna affect our police department? Um, we've uh, been ahead of this um, with a big cooperative effort between our office and the, and the police department gearing up for these changes that take effect uh, in a couple of weeks. Uh, the police department's issued a directive already prohibiting um, chokeholds and neck restraints. That was in August, back in August of 2020. Now that's gonna be required by this law, but this is something that we're already uh, ahead of in, in department policy. Um, Nonviolent offenses are going to require a different response and generate a different response from the police now. Um, it, it, residential burglary, for example, or, or auto theft, um, police will likely respond to make a report and gather information uh, and evidence, interview people with um, for, for information. And the Auburn Police Department reporting system uh, to collect information regarding the limits of uh, law enforcement response, any complaints received, and the impact on the criminal enforcement. Good afternoon, Council and Mayor Kendra Como, City Attorney. I will be presenting on the use of force bill, which is engrossed uh, Senate House Bill 1310. There is a lot to this bill, so um, bear with me as I hit the highlights of it. Uh, the use of force bill establishes a standard for the use of physical force by police officers, including providing those circumstances when force is permissible. This bill directs the Attorney General to issue a model policy on use of force and de-escalation by July 1st, 2022. The bill itself though, and Auburn's requirements to comply with the bill begin on July 25th, 2021. So when can an officer use physical force under this bill as prescribed by the bill? Um, that is limited to when necessary to protect against criminal conduct, when there is probable cause to make an arrest, affect an arrest, or protect an, from an in-custody escape. Uh, an officer can use physical force to protect against an imminent threat of bodily injury to the law enforcement officer, another person, or the person against whom force is being used. An officer can use deadly force only when necessary to protect against an imminent threat or serious physical injury or death. And it establishes a new duty of reasonable care for Washington law enforcement officers. 1310 also requires that when possible, though that term is not defined, but when possible that an officer exhaust available and appropriate de-escalation tactics prior to using any physical force. The bill provides a non-exclusive list of those de-escalation tactics. They include such items such as time, distance, and cover, calling for additional resources, including backup officers and or crisis intervention team or mental health professionals designating one officer to communicate with a subject, taking as much time as necessary without using physical force or weapons, leaving the area if there is no threat of imminent harm and no crime has been committed or is being committed or is about to be committed. And when using physical force, using the least amount of physical force necessary to overcome resistance under the circumstances and in consideration of the characteristics and conditions of that individual. Um, items to be considered under the bill include um, such characteristics as pregnancy, age, signs of mental, behavioral, or physical impairments or disabilities, perceptual or cognitive impairments such as alcohol or drugs, if the individual is suicidal, um, whether there's limited English proficiency or the presence of children. And then the bill also states that um, officers are to terminate the use of force as soon as the necessity for such force ends. So potential impacts we've highlighted on this slide, um, they may include delays in responses. Um, so that might be because a mental health counselor or crisis communicator maybe is not available to respond to that scene. 
this is obviously a statewide bill and the demands on our local resources are going to increase. And um, from the bill, there is no additional funding for local agencies, no, or for those um, resources that are important to partner with as we work through these things. And then turning to the Blake bill, what's known as the Blake bill, I'll turn it back to Harry Boucher. And this is a, a bill that uh, has been in the works for quite some time. And we've uh, talked about it a little bit in connection with the recent ordinance that uh, the council considered. This is the bill that uh, changed state law regarding the knowing possession of a controlled substance, um, rendering it now a, a misdemeanor as opposed to a felony, which is what it, it used to be. The other thing that this bill does is it puts a requirement on police to um, refer uh, individuals who are subject to uh, controlled substance laws, refer them to assessment and, and services uh, rather than the um, referral to the prosecutor or to the legal system. Uh, there's a lot of questions about exactly what that referral process is supposed to look like and what the requirements of it are um, that I think a lot of localities are, are struggling with, um, including, including ours. Um, the other part of this bill is decriminalizing uh, drug paraphernalia that's used for personal use, um, such as uh, drug pipes or syringes and, th and things of that nature. So what are the impacts, uh, again, with this uh, Blake bill and, and the uh, decision that came from it? Um, Auburn police are probably going to refer drug possession cases to the prosecutor's office rather than making a, a physical arrest in most, most of those cases. They'll also be providing referrals uh, to services in our community and, and uh, in our locality. Um, we do have some concerns about it that uh, drug paraphernalia, paraphernalia related items might be more prevalent in our community. Um, to help us solve that, we re-engaged with work crew and uh, community service to try to clean up litter and debris, which would include uh, those things. We also are uh, looking at expanding training and uh, personal protective equipment for individuals who engage in those programs. Um, part of the bill talks about uh, the referral to services and it proposes what they call a recovery navigator program that will, police will be able to use to refer uh, drug suspects to in lieu of uh, criminal justice uh, involvement. That is uh, in process uh, and it is subject to funding. So there's no uh, certainty quite yet as to what that's exactly gonna look like and if it's even funded. And finally, uh, these referrals will need to be tracked between agencies somehow. Uh, so for example, if an individual is in Kent and gets referrals from police, uh, how would our office share that information and vice versa? How would we coordinate our efforts to make sure that uh, people are getting referrals and have they gotten the necessary referrals such that they could then be um, moved further into the system? Uh, Bill 5066 establishes a couple of uh, duties on uh, police. Uh, the first one is excessive force. If an identifiable on-duty peace officer sees another peace officer engaging in or trying to engage in excessive force, the witnessing officer has to intervene to put an end to it and put a, uh, or prevent its further use. The other thing is the officer has to render aid at the earliest safe opportunity for anyone who's injured by the use of force. And then just correspondingly, if you're on, an identifiable on-duty officer, if you witness any wrongdoing committed by another peace officer, or you have a good faith, reasonable belief that such wrongdoing is occurring, you have to report it to your department and your superiors. Um, if any disciplinary action results from the failure to engage in these duties as you're now are required as a peace officer, that discipline uh, notice can be sent to the CJTC, which is our state uh, criminal justice training commission. And that can lead to suspension or even revocation of a peace officer's uh, ability to be a peace officer. And the impact on us, this is again, something that our police department has been ahead of uh, for quite some time. For the last 10 years, we've had policies requiring these uh, types of things uh, on the books already. Now they are being moved into state law with the passage of this bill. 
and CJTC uh, is now going to receive reports mandatorily if these policies are violated. The next bill we will cover is the bill right number 1223. That's the Electronic Record Recordation Act. Um, the timing is well suited for tonight after you all have sat through the body camera presentation. So this is the bill that Chief O'Neill alluded to earlier in the meeting. It requires law enforcement officers to electronically record custodial interrogations if the interrogation is of a juvenile or related to a felony. It requires law enforcement officers to electronically record audio and video of qualifying custodial interrogations at a jail, police or sheriff's station, obviously here that'd be the police station, and or in a holding cell or correctional facility. It requires law enforcement officers to electronically record at a minimum audio of any other custodial interrogations. And it requires law enforcement agencies to establish and enforce rules and procedures relating to electronic recordings of those custodial interrogations. So we've highlighted the potential impacts on this slide, though you've had that hour long um, Axon presentation earlier today about the potential local costs for the purchase, deployment, use, and management of body-worn cameras. Um, there'll be additional costs associated with personnel to support those body-worn cameras. And this bill did not provide for any local funding to help the city absorb those additional requirements. The next bill is the juvenile access to an attorney. Um, so under this bill, Law enforcement is required, subject to some limited exceptions in the bill, to provide juveniles with an in-person or remote access to an attorney prior to any waiver of the juvenile's constitutional rights when law enforcement is questioning a juvenile during a custodial interrogation. Uh, detaining a juvenile based on probable cause of involvement in criminal activity or uh, requesting that a juvenile provide consent to certain evidentiary searches of the juvenile or the juvenile's property. This bill provides that the consultation with an attorney may not be waived and it establishes subject to limited exceptions that statements made by a juvenile after they are contacted by law enforcement in a manner described above are inadmissible in court. Um, as evidence in trial, unless that juvenile makes an express, knowing, intelligent, and voluntary waiver of rights after being provided with access to counsel and being fully informed of their rights. And it addresses um, some other items, but I will note that um, the State Office of Public Defense is tasked with providing those attorneys, and uh, it doesn't appear that there will be sufficient funding for the office to provide um, attorneys at the ready for those juveniles. So the potential impact uh, could be um, a couple different things. So one might be that juveniles who are already vulnerable in society due to several factors, often their age, um, might be recruited to participate more in adult criminal enterprises. Um, I know Chief O'Neill and the police department is working to find other resources to help interrupt that gang recruitment of juveniles in the community. And then also uh, we are not exactly sure how we can expeditiously provide the juvenile with access to an attorney as provided by the bill, but we will continue looking through um, potential resources and working with other agencies so that we can uh, comply with the bill and uh, move forward. Now, before I turn it back to, to Chief O'Neill here, I did want to highlight a couple of the other bills that were um, in the introduction slide. So just to provide a brief update, and as you um, have more questions, please feel free to reach out to me or to Chief O'Neill or to Harry as well. Um, but uh, the House Bill 1267, Office of Independent Investigations, is also a new creation from this legislative session. Uh, the governor under this bill has created the Office of Independent Investigation under the Office of the Governor to investigate deadly force incidents involving police officers. Um, this bill requires law enforcement agencies to notice the Office of Independent Investigation of any incident under the jurisdiction of that office 
and to surrender the scene upon arrival of investigators of the Office of Independent Investigations. So this will be a statewide office. We're not exactly sure what it will look like at the local level in the response times. Senate Bill 5051 is a bill that um, deals with the Criminal Justice Training Commission. It expands the abilities of the Criminal Justice Training Commission to do certain things such as um, making changes to the certification and decertification processes for police officers. Um, it modifies records retention requirements for law enforcement. And it does require employing agencies to report all separations and other specified incidents to the CJTC. And then the CJTC will have a public database containing information related to officers, investigation and decertification proceedings. So that will be implement, implemented by the CJTC, but we'll have some compliance requirements as part of that. Senate Bill 5055 um, discusses arbitrations and it establishes mandatory procedures for selecting arbitrators for those uh, police related grievance arbitrations. And um, the Public Employee Relations Commission, often referred to as PERC, will appoint those arbitrators um, as required under this bill. And then Senate Bill 5259 law enforcement data requires the Attorney General's office to establish an advisory group to make recommendations for the design, development, and implementation of a statewide program for collecting, reporting, and publishing law enforcement use of force data. This requirement um, will be placed on the AG to complete by April 1, 2022. And it requires the Attorney General to engage in um, certain procurement processes to select a institution of higher education to implement a statewide use of force data program. And then all law enforcement agencies are required to report all instances of use of force by no later than three months after that program is implemented and can accept reports. So those are the specific bills. And then I will I'll turn it over to Chief O'Neill to give a summary of the steps forward. Thank you, City Attorney Como and uh, Deputy City Attorney uh, Boche. Um, after looking at these bills and reviewing, uh, there have been hours of analysis spent with city attorneys, other attorneys and local police chiefs trying to uh, develop a path forward uh, to meet the needs of our community and to meet the needs of our police officers that serve our communities. Um, and looking at these bills, um, if you recall in February, the police advisory committee came to council and presented uh, calling for accountability in our community for members of our community that victimize uh, others. And after we go through our steps forward and things that we may need to consider changing in the way uh, that we may need the police after this, um, I reminded our officers that um, law enforcement uh, represents the community and the community has voiced what they uh, wanted through our electeds in the form of state legislators in this case. And so this style of policing, while some members of our community may not agree with it and others uh, may agree with it, this is um, what our community members have asked for through the elected process. And so we are forced to adapt to these changes. And it's not up to us as law enforcement to decide if it's right, wrong, or indifferent, we just have to adjust to it. Um, the biggest impact uh, that creates the way we respond to calls really comes from House Bill 1310. And there's two things in 1310 that really stand out. Uh, it's a fundamental duty of law enforcement to preserve and protect all human life. That has always been the case of law enforcement. Law enforcement's uh, top priority is to uh, protect all human life, um, except in circumstances where there's a serious threat of serious bodily injury and or death to an officer or another. And then they also restrict the use of force to incidents where there is an imminent threat of bodily injury to a peace officer or another. Um, well, in circumstances of property crimes, uh, it's rare that there's an imminent threat of bodily injury to a peace officer or another if we don't attempt a physical arrest. So in cases where individuals who have victimized our community um, are going to resist arrest um, 
under this law, we're forced with very few options. And one of those options is going to be uh, to walk away uh, instead of making a custodial arrest. So some of the changes that we're looking at, and we continue to look for solutions so that we can meet the needs of all of our community members, but thefts and shoplifts under $250. Uh, currently, we have a process in place in our city that a lot of businesses use where they are able to complete a report, uh, loss prevention or a designated store employee completes a report when they're the victim of a shoplift. And they even know who the suspect was that committed that shoplift. They complete that report and file it directly with the prosecutor's office in lieu of having a uh, police officer respond to the scene. Uh, so this is a program that we are going to try and expand uh, to work with our community members and business owners uh, and make that program available to every uh, business in the city. Uh, our community response team runs that program and they have been working with our uh, city attorney's office uh, to establish uh, training uh, dates for uh, the implementation or expansion of that program, if you will. And I know they have several dates on the books already and our goal is to uh, train every business that wants to participate in this program uh, by September 1st. Uh, and so starting tomorrow, we will start pushing this information uh, out to our community. Um, the next service that we need to look at and consider, and again, we're gonna continue looking for solutions to all of these uh, changes um, as we work through them so that we can meet the needs of our community. Uh, but right now, uh, law enforcement uh, serves orders out of a courtesy to uh, citizens, our community members. Um, we're not required to serve all of the orders. You know, options are when you get an order, you can either have somebody over the age of 18 or a process server serve a lot of civil orders. But we have done that as a courtesy for years. We're probably going to restrict that and only serve the orders that we're required to serve that are related to domestic violence or the surrender of firearms. Uh, currently, we respond to medical facilities to include mental health facilities to assist with involuntarily committing people. Um, the national narrative right now is that law enforcement should be calling uh, mental health professionals more and having mental health professionals deal with community members who are suffering from mental illness. So in order to respond to this demand, um, we are going to allow medical facilities and mental health uh, facilities to do their own involves and no longer respond to those unless there is a unique or specific uh, circumstance that requires a police officer. Um, right now, we get called to a lot of welfare checks that are not criminal in nature. Um, so our sergeants, this is going to put more responsibility on our sergeants to look at these calls and screen them. And if there's not something criminal in nature occurring, or there is not an immediate need uh, for a police officer to respond to that, we are either going to refer that call to fire or um, not respond unless circumstances change. Uh, misdemeanor crimes. Uh, when it comes to misdemeanor crimes and we're looking at uh, social and racial justice and equitable policing, um, it's not equitable to only make arrest on misdemeanor crimes for individuals that choose to not resist arrest. Because uh, again, under 1310, uh, if a person chooses to resist arrest, uh, if there's not going to be an imminent threat of bodily injury and or harm to another person or a police officer, uh, we should consider walking away unless we can exhaust all of those less lethal options that City Attorney Como had mentioned. Uh, so for most misdemeanor crimes, we are not going to make a physical arrest. We are going to complete a report and issue a citation or refer that case to the prosecutor's office with the exception of DUIs and DVs. Um, suspicious subjects or another call that we get a lot that are often not criminal in nature. Um, so unless there is a clearly articulated criminal activity, uh, we are going to look for alternatives uh, to an officer responding directly to that call. Uh, it might uh, result in a uh, phone call to the RP to further um, 
to further the understanding of what they're seeing to ensure that there's actually criminal activity occurring before an officer shows up uh, in person. Uh, juvenile problems, civil issues and disputes. Uh, in the 90s, we started uh, community-oriented policing, where essentially if you called for a police officer, you got one. Uh, police officers have responded to calls because an uh, eight-year-old child uh, was arguing with the parents and refusing to go to school, uh, or there was a wild animal that got into your house, or even if you had a clogged uh, sink, you could call the police and the police would show up uh, and help you. Um, a lot of those things, though, are not criminal in nature, and we're at a time where um, our communities are asking for people other than police officers to show up to non-criminal uh, incidents. Trespass and unwanted persons. Uh, we respond to a lot of calls of unwanted subjects who then leave once uh, the property owner calls the police. Uh, if the person has left, that solves the problem and uh, individual property owners uh, have the right to trespass uh, folks on their own once they tell them to leave. So once a person has left and the problem has been solved, uh, we are going to, in most circumstances, look for alternatives than an actual police officer responding in person. Uh, suicidal subjects. So in most circumstances, and this comes at the advisement of our attorneys through our insurance carrier, um, but they believe that law enforcement should not be responding uh, to suicidal subjects unless uh, other community members or family members are going to be uh, in danger and a suicidal person is armed with a weapon. Uh, if that is not the case, uh, police officers are probably now going to make contact by phone uh, and refer them to resources to get them the help that they need. Uh, if the person agrees to an involuntary uh, committal, uh, then we will facilitate that, but that's probably going to look different than it does now. That's probably going to include the person uh, coming out to us uh, once an ambulance arrives and uh, having a seat on the curb um, and limiting that interaction uh, with the police officer. Uh, controlled substances. Um, as uh, Deputy City Attorney uh, Boucher talked about under the Blake ruling, uh, when a person is uh, found in possession of a controlled substance, uh, the first two have to be referred to services. Uh, so unless uh, we can determine that a person is actually engaging in illegal drug activity um, in order to prevent uh, the escalation of what is now non-criminal activity, we will be uh, providing resources to individuals in involved in uh, drug activity. Uh, lost property. Uh, right now we do a lot of lost property reports that are uh, reported online as mandatory e-reports. Uh, we are going to expand that to include all lost property reports. Uh, traffic complaints. Right now uh, patrol units will only be dispatched if a traffic unit is not working. Uh, if a traffic unit is working, they will be solely responsible for all traffic complaints. Uh, parking complaints will be forwarded to parking enforcement to follow up on if they are not at work, unless there is a safety hazard or a vehicle is blocking mailboxes on a day that mail is to be delivered. Uh, RVs and trans, uh, transient camps will be referred to our community response team who will follow up on their next working day. Um, and the reason for that is they are most equipped uh, to handle that type of incident. They have direct access to uh, resources, and they also uh, work with the Salvation Army and Kent Hay, and um, they're the best, uh, the best unit within the police department to get uh, those folks uh, help and resources that they need. Uh, property crimes without suspect info will be referred to e-reporting. And then noise complaints in multifamily housing complexes. Uh, right now we go to a lot of uh, loud, loud music complaints, uh, juveniles playing uh, basketball in the courtyard that's loud, uh, other complaints like that. Um, and the reality is uh, law enforcement um, doesn't have a lot of authority to take action on those issues. 
the best course of action is for the property manager who can actually take action against those tenants who are creating issues and problems. Uh, and so we are going to uh, work with our property managers and providing them with training to uh, adequately handle those issues. Uh, we are currently working to add services to our website that we are going to refer community members uh, to to get assistance and help with a lot of these issues. Um, and the reason that we need to change uh, the way that we're responding to some of these calls is because we have to have uh, the officers and the resources available uh, for the violent crimes that we go to or the situations where we are required uh, to make an arrest. And we need to ensure that uh, we have plenty of officers there to um, explore the uh, now required uh, de-escalation uh, tactics. So now we will take questions. Questions, anyone? Uh, uh, I didn't see who, who had the hand first, uh, either Council Member Baggett or is it Council Member Stearns? Council Member Stearns was first. Okay. Council Member Stearns. I was quick on the draw. Uh, hmm. <laughs> um, thank, thank you for the, the really comprehensive report. Um, definitely seems like there are, are a lot of changes. I had uh, two quick questions. One was on the uh, uh, steps forward um, and then the slide that had RVs and transient camps. And I, I, I think what you described was the new approach for RVs, but is, is there a new approach for transient camps? It's uh, not necessarily a new approach. Um, Patrol responds to those from time to time, uh, but we're solely going to uh, refer those complaints that come in from our community to our community response team uh, as they're best equipped and have the most resources to deal with that type of uh, complaint. You know, when we get a uh, complaint of a transient camp, our top priority is to find resources and shelter uh, for that individual that is unsheltered and uh, camping uh, maybe in a park or uh, in the wetlands or the woods or uh, some other part of our community. Okay, thanks. And then um, lastly, um, on, on the, um, the Blake decision, I, I guess I was just wondering if there's, if you have a sense yet of how, you know, a real world situation might unfold. If, um, you know, say I, I saw someone um, just, you know, sitting on the street, um, using you know a personal amount of meth or heroin and I called that in what what would happen could you explain that yeah so if you call in and say there's a person uh sitting on the side of the street using meth uh for example and you know they're using meth and an op an officer will respond uh we'll check and see if uh they've had their two referrals uh previously uh if not we will uh, take the uh, methamphetamine, uh, put that into evidence to be destroyed and give them a uh, referral of services. Uh, the officers will then write a report and note that they had their first uh, referral for that person. Uh, if it's their third referral or beyond, uh, we will follow the same process, except we will then uh, send the report to the prosecutor's office for them to review it for uh, the filing of charges. Oh, okay. That, that makes a lot of sense. Um, wh what, when you say the referral, how does that work? Yeah, so we have uh, resources right now. Um, I don't know the exact company off the top of my head, but we have cards made that all of our officers have. Uh, it's also on that website. Uh, a lot of people have smartphones out there. And so we created a, a QR code. All the officers have it on the back of their phone. So when they encounter somebody else with a smartphone, they can just take a picture of that QR code. It takes them to a link on our website that has tons of resources, whether it's uh, mental health counseling, uh, homeless shelters, uh, substance abuse, 
uh, juvenile problems, uh, King County dispute resolution, uh, and we're continuing to grow those resources. So that's a referral of services that we give them. And then obviously, if they don't have a smartphone or a way to get to our webpage, then we're giving them a uh, card with the information. Oh, okay, great. Thank you so much. Council Member Baggett. Thank you, Council Member Jayaraj. Uh, Dan, a uh, quick question. Uh, are all of the House bills and Senate bills that, uh, in your presentation, have those all been signed into law? Yes, they have. They were all signed into law in May of uh, 2021. Uh, don't okay. quote me on the exact day, but I think it was May. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much. You bet. Council Member Brown. Thank you, Council Member Jay Raj. Um, first off, I first off, I really would like to thank uh, Chief O'Neill for the way you expressed your leadership there, talking about the mandate from the citizens as expressed through the legislative process. That's real leadership, and and I just want you to know I appreciate that. Uh, number two. You know, a lot of legislation passed and I don't think, you know, with the COVID and, and the way the legislature worked this last session, with the amount of bills that were passed, as in most uh, any legislative session, but maybe especially now, uh, there are some unintended consequences. We talked about resources available for juvenile uh, suspects or uh, uh, juvenile uh, folks in custody, uh, as an example. Uh, is there a plan uh, to categorize and um, compile a list of issues that the police department would find or perhaps the uh, prosecuting or our city attorney's office uh, to compile the list of potential issues that need to be addressed subsequent in subsequent legislative sessions? Yeah, first of all, I wanna thank you for your kind words. I appreciate it. This has been a uh, challenging time and I think uh, leaders in the region have been, uh, we've definitely been tested to navigate a way through this. Um, we have, uh, so when we complete a police report, there's a circumstance code and we've created a special circumstance code if, it, uh, if there's gonna be a change in the way we respond to something as a result of uh, the legislative reforms that have been passed so that we can compile statistics to help identify some of those unintended consequences. Um, and so we're gonna use those as a pathway moving forward. Uh, we are also uh, meeting regionally, or I'm sorry, meeting regularly with the other chiefs and city attorneys in the area to talk about some of these unintended consequences so that we can uh, prepare them to share with our state legislators and our lobbyists as we head into um, the next legislative session next year. And Council Member Brown, if I might add, the uh, SCA, the mayors have been discussing this as well and planning on meeting with our legislators, especially the ones in South King County, who many of them were sponsors of these bills. Uh, to discuss that very thing. Thank you very much, uh, Mayor and Chief. Council Member Malenga. Uh, thank you for the presentation tonight. Very informative and a lot of information. Um, I just wanted to know with all these new changes, is there any training that's being provided to um, help the police with this new um, response to the violent scenes and things like that. I mean, cause you guys present a lot of information. So is there training for the officers and all these new changes? Yeah, and this is where I really have to uh, thank uh, city attorney Como and deputy city attorney uh, Boche for the work that they've been doing with us for uh, the past eight months to identify all these bills and come up with a uh, path forward. And we have started training with all of our police officers. Uh, the first training session was on July 2nd. And then we had two training sessions this past Friday. 
Uh, we have another one scheduled and then a final one on August 6th where all of our police officers will be trained on um, each of these bills, uh, the impact that it has on policing, uh, the changes that they need to make in the field. Um, and then tomorrow morning, we actually have uh, training for our entire leadership team. That's uh, myself all the way down to sergeants um, to bring them up to speed on these bills and uh, the changes moving forward. And then we're also going to uh, look at trying to get more uh, hostage negotiator training, which is the same as uh, crisis communicator training uh, for our officers. Uh, one thing that makes that a little difficult is you have to be assigned to a hostage negotiation team to get that training. But we're going to look to see if we can get one of those trainers uh, to just come in and train a, a large group of our officers so we can expand the number of crisis communicators that we have. Can I ask a follow-up question? Um, when it comes to the mental health aspect, as I mean, a lot of information, so I don't know that I'm remembering correctly, but it sounds like in some of the situations, you have to have a mental health person come out to the scene with you. If there's not one available, are the police officers also getting mental health training on how to respond to this, or is it only the professionals that are going to be the ones out there responding? Yeah, so there was a uh, state mandate passed, uh, I believe, in 2015 that required all law enforcement officers uh, to, to attend at least eight hours of crisis intervention training by this past March. Um, and then 25% of your um, patrol staff had to do the full 40 hours. Well, here at the Auburn Police Department, we mandated that all of our, every commission employee do the full 40 hours. So we've all had the 40 hours of crisis intervention training. And then there's a two hour uh, refresher that's mandated by the state each year uh, that we uh, participate in. And then um, there is a uh, challenge right now that we're experiencing when it comes to mental health calls. For example, last night we had a uh, barricaded female who was experiencing mental illness. Uh, she fired five rounds at her parents uh, and then barricaded herself with a gun. Uh, and so that's a great call for a mental health professional. Uh, and we called, but unfortunately, the thing that we run into is a mental health professional will not come out to the scene until the person is in custody or the scene is safe. And we need to uh, really work with our communities and find resources uh, to get mental health professionals uh, engaged in an active uh, incident because that's when we need them. Council Member Trout Manuel. Thank you, Council Member Deron. Uh, Chief O'Neill, uh, with all these um, new laws coming down and everything, are, is your department going to do a dashboard uh, to accumulate all the incidents and, and keep a data on board? Uh, King County, they shared that dashboard that they have started and it included all the cities uh, in, um, uh, up north and they were including some of the South King County cities as well. Are we going to be doing something like that? You know, that's a uh, excellent question. There is a uh, mandate in these bills that requires uh, law enforcement to report data and uh, collect and track data. And I think um, we're at the stage right now where we're waiting to see what that's gonna look like and what's gonna be uh, required of us to report and then develop a plan moving forward so that we're in compliance with that. But that, okay. that could certainly be a possibility. Um, unfortunately, I think uh, until we know what's going to be uh, required to track and report, uh, um, it, it would be, uh, I, I would hate to do something and then have to redo it because we didn't set it up the right way initially. Right, right. Okay, thank you, Chief O'Neill. You bet, thank you. Anyone else has a question? Okay, um, I have a couple of questions. Uh, Chief or one of the attorneys can uh, answer my question. Under the Blake bill. So sounds like we're talking about an individual who's using um, drugs on a personal uh, consumption basis. It doesn't talk about trafficking. Uh, what, what happens about what happens with traffickers? Mm 
So when it comes, to, yeah, sorry, Chief, do you want me to take that or? Um, go ahead if you want to give a shot. <laughs> um, I'll defer to the chief, I suppose, on the specifics of uh, how those are investigated. But I, you are correct that the bill uh, addressing Blake does not deal with what are traditionally still felonies, and those are uh, drug trafficking and drug production, manufacturing, those kinds of things uh, still remain mm -hmm. felonies. So you're correct that uh, it is targeting uh, individual possession uh, for misdemeanor treatment, and that was the change. Okay, so it's only for personal consumption at this point. Um, and the law hasn't changed as far as trafficking, trafficking, manufacturing, and all that. Correct. Okay. Um, the next question I have is the uh, demilitarization of weapons. Um, what happens to SWAT if that's the case? Yeah, so we're still uh, working through that bill. Uh, it looks like right now the only equipment that our SWAT team is going to have to give up that we can't possess is going to be shotguns. And we only use those shotguns uh, as a breaching tool right now. So we shouldn't have to uh, forfeit um, much of the equipment that we have uh, assigned to SWAT. And then uh, obviously the uh, tactics... Uh, uh, that SWAT uses will have to be modified and changed to be in compliance with uh, 1310. Now, I, I believe that the shotguns you use is also used for beanbags too, right? Yes, that is correct. A shotgun is used to fire a beanbag round, but we no longer use uh, beanbag rounds. We haven't used those okay. uh, in quite a few years. We've uh, moved on to a, uh, a better tool that's actually uh, less intrusive to the person uh, uh, on the receiving end of that. Okay. Well, thank you very much, Chief. Oh, by the way, uh, anybody else has a question before I close this? No. Thank you, Chief. Uh, thank you, uh, uh, City Attorney Como and uh, City Attorney Deputy Attorney Boucher. Thank you very much for the great presentation. Uh, uh, Deputy Mayor uh, DeCourcy, you may take it away. You have one more item on your agenda, Councilmember J. Raj, Community Court. Oh, Court. that's right. I do have, uh, uh, with that said, Community Court update, City Attorney Kendra Como. Thank you, Councilmember Jay Raj and Deputy Mayor DeCourcy. Just one minute, I'm going to share my screen one more time for a presentation and then I will start introductions. All right, so we'll get started with our community court update for the Auburn Community Court. Before I get started, I do want to let council know we have several people on the panel for this presentation, including Deputy City Attorney Harry Boucher, Sergio Flores, who is a prosecutor in the City Attorney's Office, Gloria Cody, who's a paralegal, and then we have Judge Matthew York from the King County District Court, who is the judge for the Auburn Community Court and Trisha Grove from our Public Defender's Office. So we will do the PowerPoint presentation providing that information and then we'll have questions at the end and I encourage counsel to include Judge York and Ms. Grove's office with any questions since they are giving up their valuable time also this evening and are excited about this program as well. So on the slide in front of you, I have highlighted the purpose of the community court. This is an important partnership between the King County District Court and the City of Auburn. Community court is an alternative diversion type court that allows cases to be handled by referrals to community resources in order to address a participant's underlying needs that likely led to that criminal activity. Such problems um, that we're trying to address through the community court can include homelessness, extreme poverty, addiction, or mental health. 
And we're really trying to rethink criminal justice with this program. While not everyone with these challenges I've mentioned commits crime, Community Court is hopeful for providing that effective alternative for those folks that do, and to hold participants accountable while offering resources and support to build a better life and to hopefully reduce recidivism in our community. As I mentioned, we have several really important partners in the operation of Community Court each week on Thursdays, including King County District Court Judge York, the Public Defender's Office with Ms. Grove, Prosecution, um, Harry Boche, Sergio Flores, and Gloria Cody, they're out there every week. Kent Hay, who operates from the mayor's office, he's out there with the Auburn uh, Consolidated Resource Center and working with those service providers every Thursday afternoon. Our community service providers that are part of that resource center are key to the work in the Auburn Community Court. And then the City of Auburn work crew. And you might have questions of how that integrates with the Auburn Community Court and Sergio Flores will address that at the end. So where are we located? We are at 2816 Auburn Way North. Some of you might remember this as the location of the old sports page. The Auburn Food Bank is currently at that location. And court operates on Thursdays from 1.30 to the end of that calendar Thursday afternoon. So if any of you want to stop by or any member of the public want to stop by, please feel free at 1.30. It is an open public courtroom. And Gloria will cover the eligibility guidelines during this presentation. Then I will ask Harry to discuss the scope of community court, particularly in light of recent changes to the law. And then Sergio, as I mentioned, will walk through what community court operations look like each Thursday. But again, please include uh, Judge York and Ms. Grove with any questions that you might have. So I wanna talk about the space first. Um, the real estate division does report to me under the city attorney's office. So the lease in this space um, began in February of 2020. We leased 22,000 square feet. We do have an active sublease with the Auburn Food Bank. Um, they are operating their day and night shelter out of that location right now. And We Care Daily Clinic will be coming soon and I'll detail that in a minute. We are continuing conversations with other local resource providers as well. So this was quite the big lift for the real estate division. In March of 2021, we did the design and construction of the temporary community court space in the resource center. So each of those spaces is 2000 square feet. We worked with an architect, HVAC contractor, and Josh Arndt in particular, the real estate manager. He worked with these individuals to obtain building permits and to work with the distribution and mechanical permit. So from the time of design to permit was extraordinary. Josh was able to complete that in just three weeks. This was the space when we rented it and we started our work out there. Here's another shot of it. So for the construction in this space, once we leased it, um, and then going through March of 2021, we constructed demising walls, we rerouted and extended power, we rerouted the plumbing, we remodeled a restroom there to meet ADA requirements. We worked to redistribute the HVAC system, and then we also put in some flooring and paint. So you'll see carpet out there, and it's just a nice space now to be able to work in. Um, particularly in this uh, build out, given the timeline and given the scope of what we were doing. Um, I know I owe many thanks to uh, Mayor Backus, the administration team, multimedia specifically in administration, Kent Hay, the entire legal department was out there at one point or another and helping us work through different issues. The Auburn Police Department, um, our IT department has been out there because Currently, um, there is a, a remote um, option for community court to allow Judge York um, to be able to remote in to that space, and IT has been integral with that. Facilities was very helpful in um, helping pick the carpeting and the paint and to help get through that process. HR has been working with us in finance as well. So the construction timeline from permit issuance was just three weeks. So in total, from design to completing this build out was six to seven weeks at most with a total cost of about $122,000.
This is the space now that you see on the screen. We do have the chairs six feet apart for um, COVID requirements. And it is an open public courtroom, like I mentioned. So anybody can come in. There is a space for any um, individuals that come in if they have small children, because we are trying to remove any barriers to court and invite anyone that um, wants to come in either to observe or to participate into our space. And then the property updates as we continue in the space. Again, Auburn Food Bank is a current sub lessee. We Care Daily Clinic is working on finalizing that sublease. Um, we are working on license agreements for those service providers that um, have scheduled use of the Auburn Resource Center. And the Auburn Consolidated Resource Center will have room for two more permanent sub lessees in the future. And I'll ask council to stay tuned for the future permanent build out of the Auburn Community Court and Auburn Resource Center that will be a 6,000 square foot space in time. So right now we have those 2,000 square feet, um, square foot bays. Uh, and we wanted to eventually repurpose the space since Auburn Community Court is only in the afternoon on Thursdays so that we can really use that as a community space and provide plenty of opportunities for service providers. So we'll have some updates in the, in the near future. And with that, I will turn it over to Ms. Cody to speak about the eligibility criteria and the real hands-on work that she's been doing so far. It looks like Miss Cody has had some trouble connecting tonight. Harry, would you like to take this? Sure. Um, this is a, a big part of uh, community court and, and, and getting it uh, connected to the people who need the services the most. And that's the eligibility criteria. You know, who's eligible for this program? What kinds of offenses? And this is something that uh, we're constantly evaluating. Um, this is a new program for us, so we're constantly gauging, you know, are we reaching the, the right people with the right types of offenses? But generally, we've outlined uh, the types of offenses that we are looking at, criminal trespass in the second degree. Now, that's a trespass on a property that does not involve uh, going inside of a building. Uh, unlawful transit conduct, which can range from uh, consuming alcohol or, or drugs at a, like a bus station or uh, that type of conduct, uh, prostitution offenses, disorderly conduct, which is lower level um, disorderly conduct that doesn't rise to things like assaults or more serious uh, violent crime or property damage, interference with a healthcare facility. That's an offense where um, you know folks in an emergency room become disruptive uh, for various uh, reasons. Uh, violations of stay out of drug areas order, possession of auto theft tools, burglary tools, trespassing in vehicles, uh, possession of a controlled substance and our, and our camping and our unlawful camping ordinance. Um, general disqualifiers that we have. So we wanna not only target uh, offenses that we want included, but then what are some things that we would want to, to not include? And we, important to note here that the disqualifiers that we have we, we attempted to match those up with our work crew uh, eligibility as much as we could because work crew is a big part of the community court program. Uh, folks who uh, sign up and participate in community court uh, engage in work crew with the city's uh, work crew through our HR department. And so uh, folks who have on their history, class A felonies uh, on their, their history, violent crimes, sex offenses, uh, domestic violence type crimes, uh, most traffic uh, offenses like DUI, things like that, crimes against children, people who have escaped from custody or confinement, uh, hate crimes, gun related charges. You know, these are types of things that we uh, believe you, know, you should generally be disqualified. Now, of course, we're always willing to look at any individual case and any individual circumstance, but those are the parameters that we wanted to set up uh, going forward so we would know where we're looking. Or, and Harry, it looks or, like Glory has joined us. So okay, I okay. wanted to see if she had any additional information to provide because I know the work that you've done and the work that Gloria has done and continue to do every single week is so valuable both to the city of Auburn and to the success of this program. So Gloria, if you want to talk about the identification you have done so far and the work that you have put in, this would be a great time. 
Thank you. I'm sorry about that for the technical difficulties. Um, so we've we met initially back in January of 2020 to go over those eligibility criteria. Mr. Boshe was talking about, and we've kind of looked at it um, up through even you know as recently as this month, as far as what we could change in it. And so far to date, we've identified 34 people who are eligible, who meet all the, the criteria um, to participate in community court. So we've only been going since May 27th. I think that was our first meeting. So 34 people to date is, is a good number. Um, not everybody decides to opt in. Not everybody has even had court yet because um, we do identify those people ahead of time so that they have the opportunity to make that decision at their arraignment hearing. But we're hopeful that um, with the criteria that we have, we can get a good crowd, so to speak, into community court, get, get enough people in there. And then we can look at expanding the criteria to see about getting more people in there, especially when we have our permanent space and a larger space for everybody to be in. Thank you, Gloria. And I will note that the council packets might have a different number. I believe we included the number 28 for the identification number. If you have the printed version or the, the um, one that was loaded into Novus and provided last week, but we updated this. So it's a live number, 38 people as of end of day today, because of the fine work that Gloria and Harry are doing in the office, really coming through those individual cases and seeing how can we help people and how can we get um, some alternative options and resources to these individuals in our criminal justice system. And then Harry is going to speak a little bit more about the scope of community court and how it has changed recently. Correct. And so this, this just fits in with uh, the eligibility discussion we just had. So the spirit of what a community court program is, is, is it's designed to address these lower level non-traffic offenses that are brought about by persons struggling with substance abuse, mental health, or homelessness related issues. Um, it's often called uh, community or quality of life offenses is, is a lot of times in common parlance what uh, we're talking about. And um, one of the things that we've had to make a lot of changes um, is in relation to the Blake bill that we've already talked about once earlier tonight, we've talked about it previously. Um, a big part of our eligibility criteria is, is drug abuse and, and related charges, obviously. Um, so when we started this discussion, uh, one of our, our big uh, ticket offenses that we were looking at in terms of making it eligible is possession of drug paraphernalia. In 2019, for an example, we had filed over 500 cases with this charge. Uh, and so this was a, a, a very common charge that we faced and it obviously involves substance abuse to some degree. And so we wanted that included front and center on our eligibility criteria. Well, with the passage of that Blake bill, as we know, uh, personal use paraphernalia is now decriminalized entirely. And so you no longer have a criminal charge for any court, community court or, or what we would call regular adult court. Uh, on the flip side to that, initially, possession of controlled substance was something that when we first started the program and, and started talking about it, uh, we looked at that and said, well, that's technically a felony under state law. And if it is charged as a felony, then in Superior Court, they had a very uh, successful drug court program, which is, which is pretty widely known and you know, quite successful. And so we initially opted to hold off on adding possession of controlled substance among our uh, list of eligible charges. But now... There is no felony drug possession. It is now all misdemeanors for, for personal use related. And so that is a charge that uh, would certainly be among those that we would consider including. And so that's just a look at how some of these recent legal changes have shaped um, how we design our community court. Thank you, Harry. And now I'd like to introduce council and mayor to Sergio Flores. He is the newest prosecutor in our office, but he's been doing tremendous work already over at the community court. And he's put together this slide and we'll be walking council through what community court looks like each Thursday. Hi, good evening, Madam Mayor. Good evening, council members. Um, 
You do not have this slide in your packet. However, um, I would ask you to look at the screen so you can follow along. I want to walk you through the process of what community court, how community court works. Um, community court starts way before we actually uh, uh, go into community courts. The first step is starts in our office and uh, the our office looks through all the new cases and determines which uh, individual could qualify or would be a good candidate for community court. This is uh, done mostly by Ms. Cody, who uh, will review all of the cases to make sure that we have selected the right individuals based on the eligibility and based on the case and ba based on the individual itself. Um, we, after that, after that step one, then we invite the, the individual to participate in community court. We send an email to the, the uh, public defenders as well as uh, the court, letting them know before the arraignment of the individuals that we, the city, think should be invited to participate in community court. Um, if, the, if the individual decides to participate in community court, then we, we move to step three. If they don't, then that individual has the right to continue with their case, just like any other criminal case. They have the right to a trial. They have a right to resolve, resolve their case if they, if they want to. However, if they do choose to participate with us um, or they're interested, we have them do a, um, a risk and needs assessment. And that is done by uh, Mr. Kent Hay and he will do this assessment one by one. He goes through uh, many questions that will identify what are the reasons that these individuals are struggling, what are the reasons that they are committing these crimes, in order for us to be able to identify how we can help them through this community court process. The next step is the city will draft a contract. It is, this contract is, um, call a stipulated order for continuance. And this type of contract is very common in criminal law, is very common in the criminal legal system. So we're not reinventing the wheel, we're just using a tool in our, in our tool belt to be able to um, create a document, create an agreement with the participant so that we can put all of the terms of that agreement in the contract. They understand what they have to do. And they also understand that if they meet with all of the conditions, they are going to get their case dismissed at the end of community court. So it is very important that we, we set all of that information in the contract. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in, in a little bit. Um, the next step is we present that, that SOC, uh, that contract to the judge, and if approved, then the participant begins community court. That is when we are in the space and we are actually in community court. The next step is for the participants to meet with service providers. And that happens um, in, the, in the resource center, which is right next to the community court. And they meet with different uh, service providers in order to see how they can engage them in treatment or they can engage them in services uh, for them to be able to meet the requirements that are listed in that contract. The second, the next step after that is for the participants to engage in that treatment that is required or in obtain the services that they're also required to obtain. Some of the services can be as simple as how to obtain an ORCA card or how to sign up for parenting classes. Uh, some of the requirements are more complex and, and more uh, life-changing such as um, getting an alcohol drug assessment and getting uh, alcohol drug treatment and staying in the program and staying sober. So there, it, the, the conditions vary and sometimes uh, a contract can have multiple conditions. And the last step would be for the participant to attend community court on a weekly basis to check in and to comply with the terms of that agreement. Once they are in community court, um, so let me, let me just quickly give you a, a, an idea of how community court works on an actual date. We start, although the court starts at 1.30, the judge, the attorneys, uh, Mr. Mr. Ken, Mr. Hay, uh, the service provider, some of the people that are uh, conducting the, the evaluations or the treatment, we all meet for a pre-court pre, pre, -court, 
pre-court pre meeting where we talked to each other and identified how the participant is doing. If they are keeping in track with their agreement, if they are failing to do certain things, and then we come up with the plan of how to help them uh, get back in track with, with what they're supposed to be doing. We identified what, what are the needs, we identified how we can provide them with behavioral skills so that they're not failing to comply with those terms, whether it is showing up on time with their classes, showing up on time for treatment, et cetera. So we do that for 30 minutes um, as a group. And then at 1.30, we begin the court. And at that time is when, when, the, when we engage with the participant and check in with them. So once they do that, if they complete the term of their contract and they complete what they're supposed to be doing within that agreement, then they will uh, graduate and um, the participant will graduate. And we, we hope that all of those requirements are beneficial to them. And last, this is what the stipulated order of continuance looks like. And it is a contract where it sets forth the, um, what the, the participant is giving up. They're giving up some rights because by entering into this agreement, they're saying, we agree not to go to trial. We agree not to do, there's some of our fundamental constitutional rights are not, you know, we're waiving them. In order for us to enter into this program, we're gonna do the following things, but the benefit to them is that they will get this, their case dismissed. But most importantly, the benefit to them is that they're going to get the services and uh, treatment that they'll, they need in order to not continue to commit crimes or in order for them to just have a better quality of life and be better um, members of our community. And these are some of the, an example of some of the uh, requirements, some of the services that we require them to get, for example, education, employment. Um, and throughout this process, um, Kent Hay will work with the participant to make sure that they're staying on, in, on track with all of their requirements, that they're meeting with the right service provider in order for them to be successful in completing this. It really is a team effort. It's really, it really is a community. Everyone in there, the judge, the city, defense attorney, the volunteers, everyone is really working hard towards the same goal, which is for this individual to get better for this individual to have the resources they need to have a more productive and better life. So it is a great program. All right, so that is the end of our presentation. And we really appreciated the opportunity to share our first update on Auburn Community Court. We do plan on providing more robust updates as we have participants in the program and we learn more about how to be more effective and what we need to change and improve. And with that, I would invite any questions from council and I would invite council to um, include Judge York and our public defender, Ms. Grove, with any questions that you might have as they are very dedicated this evening as they are every Thursday afternoon. Council member Brown. Thank you very much and a great presentation. Thank you all for being here, uh, Judge York and uh, Gloria, as, as well as uh, our uh, public defender, I, I've just lost the name there. Oh, yes, uh, Tricia, thank you very much for being here. Um, you know, I was just at the very end there, I was really curious. I noticed the inquiries about education, healthcare, other issues, uh, but the work training, uh, workforce training, uh, I think that that is such an excellent uh, service to be provided. Uh, you know, there's a lot of opportunities for pre-apprenticeship, uh, which leads to full apprenticeships in the trades. You know, we're talking about living wage jobs for folks. And, uh, you know, that can't overcome every obstacle you might have, but it sure can go a long ways to helping folks. Uh, who would be the person to ask what kind of workforce training uh, resources are there? Uh, information. So, Council Member Brown, if I if I might, uh, Kent and I are working on getting those resources into the resource center. In fact, I believe you gave me some of the contact information. 
Oh, so absolutely. Yes. Anything I can do to help, Mayor. Thank you. Thank you. Council Member Stearns. Uh, thank you, uh, Council Member J. Ross. Um, thank you all for uh, that presentation. I just, um, you know, so um, amazed and grateful for all the work that's going into the community court. Um, I, I was just curious on, on the uh, the slide that you presented with the, uh, um, you know, the process for going through it. Uh, what what is is there a timeline for graduation for completing the uh, for someone completing the process. I'd like to invite Sergio to answer that question. And then I might ask um, the public defender, Trisha, to follow up on her experience or any comments that she might have as well. Thank you. Um, it would, you know, that, that it would depend on, on the case. I think it's case by case because each individual has different needs and, and, and and so at this time, it can vary from um, six months to, to more, uh, but typically we've been, we've, we've been doing six months. However, that will definitely depend on, on the individual. Okay, great, thank you. Yeah, I, I was um, fortunate enough to be able to, you know, attend a, a graduation from a, a community, it's a wellness court. And it was just uh, really something because, you know, there, there were just a lot of community members out there supporting uh, the people who graduated and, uh, you know, the transformation in their lives that, uh, that happened because of it. So uh, again, just thank you all so much for this. Deputy Mayor, DeCorsi. Thank you, Councilman Jaraj. So once the individual graduates and uh, they move forward out of the program, it may continue with education, training, other aspects. Is there any continuous follow-up that there is through the community court to help them keep on track? So yeah, Deputy I, Mayor I, I, DeCourcy, thanks for the question. After an I individual can, I can jump in graduates from community court, they technically would be finished with the program though our Auburn Consolidated Resource Center operates out there every Thursday afternoon. So those service providers and um, Kent Hayes work out there is available every Thursday afternoon to any member of the public. So that would be my initial answer. And then Judge York, did I see, if, did you unmute? Yeah. Do you have anything to add? Sure, uh, can, everyone, can everyone hear me? Yes. I don't know how good my microphone is on this thing, so. Um, so once they're done with their charge, I mean, part of the advantage of community court is it doesn't stretch out over years and that it, it gives them what they, enough time to develop good habits and a good, a, a good routine outside of what they did before to get away from their triggers. So they'd still have the resources available. No one's gonna tell them to not come to a resource center, but the, the threat of the criminal violation goes away. So we have no jurisdiction or authority over them. So hopefully we've done what we need to do over the last period of time some community courts are as short as a couple of months up to whatever time. Uh, hopefully we've done what we need to do to give them the tools and resources necessary to move forward. So they're not accountable to us anymore. They have to be accountable to themselves. And that's the tools we're hopefully giving them to be accountable to themselves. Great. Thank, thank you very much. I would tell you a public defender. Oh. I just think that the connections that they make, they're always going to be able to come back and, and see us and, and have guidance and they make relationships with their attorneys as well as everybody else that's at that table. That's a whole idea. It's collaborative. So they make relationships. So even if they're not part of our court and they've successfully graduated, if they're struggling with something, um, I believe that the relationships they've made with us, they will come back and we can help and we can guide just as people. So it may not be court oriented and hopefully we've gotten them out of the system, but we're still a people program and I think all the people that are involved care enough that we would all be there for anybody that was struggling so hopefully that's the message that gets across as well yeah and I really appreciate that that is important um, allowing people to continue on with their lives after they're basically out of the system but to make sure that they have that path forward so I appreciate that answer council member chop manual thank you council member j Rod. Uh, uh, 
Deputy Mayor DeCourcy, that was a great question. I was just thinking of asking that if uh, once they're graduated and uh, got all the services and all the tools, and um, I was just wondering if they will be followed up with uh, a social worker or um, a counselor to continue helping them because we heard the stories that Ken Hay uh, shared with us councils about um, a family that he helped out and the woman was still having some difficulties pay making her payments, her um, power bill and also her mortgage because uh, she felt like we just uh, put her out there and left her to fail. So I was just wondering, how are we gonna continue to help those individuals? And you just said um, some of the ways you're gonna do it, but will that uh, so make them survive and, and be successful or will there be more to us for us to be able to help them to succeed and live a, a, a good life? So that, that's a question for any of you, <laughs> if, you want to, if you want to answer it. Um, we're, not, we're not telling them that just because you graduate, you, you're out of treatment. Their treatment op op opportunities are still going to be available to them. Um, the housing opportunities through DSHS are still going to be available. The training is still going to be available. The, re that's, the resource center isn't just for uh, community court participants. I refer so many people day to day who appear in front of me not only from Auburn, but from Covington and other places to our resource center to say, hey, this is a place that can help you. And so once they're out of that, and as, as Ms. Ms. Grove says, um, the relationships they build are not going away. They still have their counselor. They still have their, their treatment providers. They still have their mental health, whatever medication they have, whatever health care we can line them up with, whatever they needed. It's all individual, as Mr. Flores said. It's all individual on on what they need and we're not yanking that away when they graduate. All that is still available to them and they can continue forward and use it as they are. But again, ultimately it falls on them. We wanna give them the tools so they can be accountable for themselves and not have to have us move forward. Thank you, Judge York. Anybody else, any other questions? If not, um, thank you everyone. Uh, for the participation tonight. It was very uh, intuitive and instructive. And uh, I learned a lot just by listening today. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, Deputy Mayor, you have the floor. Thank you, sir. And uh, yes, also just, uh, we've had a packed full evening tonight. Tons of information, uh, great presentations and um, I want to make one comment related to the incident that Chief O'Neill talked about last night that was de-escalated and came to a successful conclusion, showing the professionalism of SWAT, our officers, and the dedication that our uh, APD officers provide to our, our citizens in our community. So we've had a long night, Council. Is there any other discussion items this evening? Any new business? Okay, once again, thank everybody. Uh, great evening, and we are now adjourned.